presidential election increasingly in focus. GOP candidates debated for the fourth time last night, and despite his absence, Trump still leads in the polls. Plus, the AI battle heating up. AMD launches a new chip in its latest attempt to challenge rival NVIDIA for dominance in the space. We'll hear from CEO Lisa Su about the company's sky-high expectations for the next four years. And out of this world, SpaceX approaches investors for another tender offer, valuing the company at more than $175 billion, according to Bloomberg. It comes amid rumblings of a possible IPO in 2024, though, Elon Musk denies that one is coming. Well, taking the fight to NVIDIA, shares in the AI market leader took a hit Wednesday as a key competitor unveiled its hand in the battle for dominance in the sector. AMD CEO Lisa Su unveiling a so-called accelerator chip, the MI300, at an event in San Jose, California. They're seen as a big threat to NVIDIA, Meta and Microsoft both saying that they will use them. Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, spoke with AMD's CEO right after the event. AI is like in every conversation, no matter which industry you're in, no matter what you're trying to do. And for AI, you need these extremely powerful uh, GPUs. And there are very, very few companies who can build these things. And um, I'm just, um, you know, so... Uh, so excited and really, um, you know, really, you know, love being part of uh, the opportunity to really change the industry uh, with our AI tech. How long does it take to come up with a chip that has 153 billion transistors on it? Well, uh, we've been working on this roadmap for over five years. I mean, these are the types of things, you know, you don't just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to build an AI chip. Um, but it's been a you know, steady progress, right? I mean, you know, you know very much what we've been able to do with our Epic product line for all of these large data centers and cloud um, installations. Uh, we're on our fourth generation with, you know, our Zen 4 technology. It's very similar on the GPU side. Uh, we're, we're launching our, what we call our third generation um, of our GPU architecture. Every generation, it gets better. Every generation, we work really closely with our customers and partners on how to make you know their software better and how to make our systems better. So yeah, it takes um, quite a long time to do this. But what makes today so special is it's not just you know it's a great product because you know great products come along um, uh, you know all the time. But it's also a great product at the right time, solving the right problem uh, for the industry. Well, basically, AMD showing that NVIDIA is not the only game in town when it comes to these powerful chips. Um, you know, it's this M... Uh, I MI600. One. Yes, I was like, what? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, uh, is a big boon for it. It's been talked about before now. Uh, we know it's a huge uh, win for AMD in terms of it finally uh, being presented to us. It says it has one and a half times more memory capacity than its previous version of uh, its chip. Uh, it's supposed to be more energy efficient, better memory capacity than its predecessors. It says it's the... It, AMD says, Lisa Su says this, it's the highest performing accelerator in the world. So we'll certainly see if it can compete with the likes of NVIDIA, which has been the market leader. We know AMD is trying to be hot on its heels, often considered a distant second in terms of uh, its space, in terms of the chip space. Uh, but AMD is like, here, we're at the table, too. Yeah, and I actually, an error said MI600, naturally MI about MI, yeah. MI6. Uh, yes, the MI300 is exactly what it is. And I think what, it was, what was key in her talking about in this conversation, particularly, was some of the other demand that they're seeing from other companies. The company had already talked about some of the major partnerships that they've landed even out the gate here, Microsoft, Dell Technologies, HPE, Lenovo, Meta, Oracle, Supermicro, and others adopting this new instinct, MI300X and MI300A data center AI accelerators for training and inference solutions. So what does all this mean for investors as they continue to really evaluate the year that has been, and you've kind of gotten the protocol for how this industry is going to continue to move forward and address demand, and you've kind of got uh, on the top 
of this stack. You've got the applications that sit on top of the language learning models, right. and those language learning models sit on top of the chips. And this is the thrust forward and demand that we've seen, and the introduction of that chips part of this broader equation next year really could be about some of the language learning models, right. and then the applications perhaps sometime in the mid portion to back half of the year as well that really gain a lot of fanfare. Some of that Google already even talking about as our Dan Halley was breaking yeah. down to us yesterday. Yeah, and also uh, AMD uh, boosting its forecast of the addressable market from previously 30 billion to 45 billion uh, in terms of the release of this MI300, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? All right. I mean, maybe the next one will be a doubling of that. We'll see. All right, stay tuned. We'll have lots more from that interview with AMD CEO Lisa Su in our next hour right here on Yahoo Finance. Shifting our focus to politics now, GOP presidential candidates clashed on the News Nation debate stage last night. Take a listen. Nikki, I don't have a woman problem. You have a corruption problem. And I think that that's what people need to know. Nikki is corrupt. This is a woman who will send your kids to die so she can buy a bigger house. Governor Haley, would you like to respond? No. It's not worth my time to respond to him. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley drew the most criticism from fellow candidates Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis at the debate, fielding attacks on her Wall Street donor base. Haley has gained ground in recent polling, narrowing the gap with DeSantis, but both still fall far behind former President Donald Trump. With more on what we learned last night, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us. Rick, it was certainly fiery. There were some moments that certainly stood out to me. And, you know, Nikki did have a comeback about the Wall Street donor base. What did you take away? Yeah, so that was a good example of both Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis going after Nikki Haley. And the reason they're doing that is she has been gaining in the polls and also gaining support of some wealthy backers. So that's basically what Ramaswamy was going after. He said that after she left government during the Trump administration, she went and served on the Boeing board. She's now getting support and she's meeting with people uh, who run Wall Street banks. Uh, so they tried to make the, the point that that equals corruption. I'm not sure they made the point very well, um, but they're, they're going after Nikki Haley. And one thing, uh, Ramaswamy there, Chris Christie, uh, we, who we didn't see in that exchange, he went after Ramaswamy later and he said, you're the most obnoxious blowhard in America. And he does seem like it. I mean, he just lectures everybody. He interrupts, he insults everybody. Uh, and he had, uh, he actually kind of planted one or two feet on the fringe last night when he said uh, that the, the January 6, 2021 riots at the U.S. Capitol were an inside job. Somebody in the government actually planned that. He said that on a nationally televised debate. So, um, Ramaswamy coming out as um, one of the losers from the debate. I'm not sure anybody won if you define winning as gaining ground on Donald Trump. I mean, as the moderators pointed out, everybody's far behind Donald Trump. Uh, and yet we got through uh, the fourth and final GOP debate. And so, Rick, I mean, what are we still hearing from some of those voters still throwing their support behind Donald Trump? We've even got a new Monmouth University poll that found that most supporters of the former president still have preferred a primary where nobody is opposing Trump. But that's not exactly what they're going to get here. Right. Not surprising. Um, I mean, this is the whole battle within the Republican Party is um, Donald Trump is blocking out the sun from other candidates. And what we saw with these uh, four candidates last night um, narrowed down from, I think it was eight candidates in the first GOD, GOP debate over the summer, is they're all trying to find some way to get support uh, outside of Donald Trump. So Chris Christie is trying to do it by attacking Trump directly. Uh, we saw his tactic last night was to call out the other three candidates and saying, why aren't you guys attacking Donald Trump directly? And they most, for the most part, wouldn't do it. And the reason is they're kind of hoping that Trump uh, drifts away or gets uh, convicted and goes to, or goes to jail on something and he's no longer there and those other three candidates can then make a claim to the Trump voters. Um, so th who knows what's going to happen here? I mean, Ron DeSantis did say, look, I'm tired of hearing about these polls. Let's see what voters actually say when they, when they go to vote. The first vote is coming up in the Iowa caucus in January. It's about six weeks away. And um, honestly, I think all of us who have been following this and sitting through these sometimes difficult to watch the GOT, GOP debates, we'll be grateful when we actually get to the point of voting and we can actually get some kind of outcome. 
Well, thank you for watching it so I could watch The Grinch last night, Rick. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much. My pleasure, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Talk soon. Bye. Well, SpaceX's latest reported valuation is sky high, according to Bloomberg. The Elon Musk-led company has initiated discussions about selling insider shares at a price that values it at $175 billion or more. So let's dive into the possibilities of the most valuable U.S. startup's tender offer with Yahoo Finance reporter Pross Subramanian. Hey, Pross. Hey, Brad. Yeah, Bloomberg reporting that SpaceX discussing that tender offer, looking to uh, sort of uh, raise in the range of 500 to to $750 million in that tender offer there, which would still value the company, as you mentioned, at $175 billion or more, which I just want to note is more than what Boeing or any other aerospace or defense company is worth at this point. Uh, Al Root at Barron's noted that pretty incredible stuff there. But in terms of market size, yeah, it's on par with T-Mobile's of the world, Nike's of the world. Pretty big there. SpaceX a mature company at this point. You know, they're dominating the uh, commercial space launch and cargo industry. And of course, they operate the Starlink satellite internet service there. Bloomberg estimates the company has pulled in around $9 billion in revenue just last year alone. So heavy interest here by investors to kind of get in now while they can. Uh, just quickly, ahead, Ross, Brad. we, we got to follow up on this because Elon Musk has famously said in the past that he would not want to take this company public if he had the option. What is the delta? What's the shift been there? In terms of uh, what in, exactly you mean? In, the, in terms of SpaceX or? even potentially making uh, a public debut. You know, I think it's, look, if, if you can keep making money and, and satisfy your, your LPs and your investors that are privately in the company, then you can be private as long as you want. But uh, there might be some sort of, you know, bang at the door for for people that are working at SpaceX, other investors that want to cash out, they want to be unlocked at full value, whether it's going to be, you know, a, a 500 uh, billion, 750 billion, whatever it's going to be. Uh, that, that's sort of what people are looking at, right? I mean, I think that's sort of the pressure that they face with, with wanting to go public, because then you go public, you have to sort of face the scrutiny of investors and analysts and things like that. So I think that's sort of the pressure they face internally. I think if you're Musk, you're saying to yourself, I can keep my investors right now happy. I'll just stay private. All right, Pross, let's shift gears a little bit. We'll go from space to the roads. We've got a new Rivian bull joining the herd, apparently. Uh, Stiefel initiating coverage of the EV maker with a buy rating, slapping a $23 price target on Rivian shares. The bullish move comes from analyst Stephen Gingaro, who sees better pricing, strong demand for its vehicles, and margin expansion in the year ahead. Now, Pross, so given this, how do you think Rivian is set up for 2024? Because the note did also call out some potential headwinds. Uh, yeah, you know, I think pretty much there. You know, recently, the stock has been on a roll, right? Rivian up 20% in the last month, now flat for the year, which is which is kind of good for the company. Right? At this point, the stock was really getting hammered earlier. Uh, Stiefel looking at that long-term picture, it seems, in the note, claiming headwinds like range anxiety and higher interest rates will sort of ease the years ahead. Another big part mentioned that is the improving margins analysts. They're saying the company's deal with Amazon for those EDV delivery vans is a, is a good thing. New motor and battery technology and better pricing will, will, will help those margins. But the problem is companies still lost around a billion dollars last quarter. Back of the hand math here with 16,300 vehicles delivered in that quarter means they lost around over $60,000 on every car sold. So a long way to go. They are sort of seeing by 2024, the end of 2024, some improvements there in margins to the possibility of getting break even status. But still, you're losing $60,000 on each car. Uh, you have a long way to go before you know, you can actually say that you're making money and, and, and you have some runway there. I think they have about a year and a half of runway. So that's kind of a big year. You're absolutely right. 2024 is huge for them. Can they reach that point of at least breaking even on their cars? That's some pretty good back of the hand math, Pross. I hope you've used a uh, washable marker. <laughs> um, at the end of the day here, though, we're going to be <laughs> continuing to watch exactly where the catalysts emerge here. I mean, they've got Amazon's agreement with the company for 100,000 cargo vehicles uh, that was also talked about within this note from Stiefel. Do you believe that the broader sentiment on the street is set for a, a more massive shift or is this going to be continuing to kind of play out as a show me story for some investors out there you know i think in this pickup space there's been a lot of positivity on rivian recently because of the fact that ford and gm have been pushing back their plans in terms of expanding their their pickup offerings or ev pickup offerings because of the fact that they're seeing demand maybe come down a little bit pricing is pretty high uh, i mean gm doesn't even have the silverado non-work truck out yet only the, only the commercial truck out right now so they're kind of pushing back on their on their on their expectations there so i think in rivian saying hey we've expanded our 
our sales every quarter. We're, we're boosting our, our yearly outlook for 2023. They've done it successive quarters in a row. So you see that positivity there, maybe in that adventure recreation space that maybe that's where, the, where we need to be for high-end expensive pickups. And maybe it's not so much a work truck thing. So we'll see how that story plays out in 2024. But I think that Rivian set up here for, in their niche, they're doing quite well. All right, Pross, thanks so much for breaking this all down for us. Appreciate it. Everything from the land and sky, Pross Supermania. It's got it covered. Just don't quote me on the back of the hand number math, all right? That's just <laughs> okay. All right, done deal. <laughs> thanks so This video is going to live forever, Pross. I mean, Pross not us. All right, thanks so much. Appreciate it, Pross. Also, switching gears here, investors keeping an eye on Japan, where the central bank's governor issued a few comments on Thursday that may mean the country exits from the ultra low interest rates that it has had for decades now. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jerry. Jared Blickery. Jared, you're mighty good with the international heat map. So what do we know on the international front with Japan? Well, I'll tell you what, this has been a long time coming. Japan has had ultra low interest rates uh, for quite some time. You have to go back to 2015 in the very beginning to get the last time they were even positive. And before that, since the global financial crisis, they were 0.1%. Uh, but it's interesting, this December meeting that we're going to have, December, I believe, 18th, 19th, is now a live meeting. And we have a graphic here that shows interest rate hikes are now getting priced in for December. And the reason this is important is because this was unexpected. Expected. Uh, traders didn't expect this to happen until next year, but now the bond market vigilantes are seeing the writing on the wall. There has been too great a differential between the interest rates in the United States and Japan. And so all this money has been flowing in to take advantage of the U.S. higher interest rates. That has been weakening the yen, and this is just unsustainable. Um, I want to go to the Wi-Fi Interactive where I have a chart here. We can see that the yen here, this is when we go down, this is U.S. dollar losing ground since it's the first in this pair. But that means the yen is strengthening today. Let me show you a year to date, and you can see kind of an opposite trend here. We have the yen weakening for most of the year. That's the U.S. dollar getting stronger. Now we've broken this trend channel, so technically we may be in store. This could be very well a top. And let me just show you a 10-year chart. This is the highest rate. This is the highest exchange rate we've seen in 10 years. You have to go all the way back to the dot-com bubble mm -hmm. to see something that's even comparable. Now, another thing that I'd note is that Japan, we're talking about Japan hiking for the first time. The U.S. started that last year. Um, this, is, this is a little bit of late to the party, but this is where Japan has been finding itself in the midst of the global business cycles for the last 20 years. Um, they are generally the last to, to a raise. They're generally the last to cut. And so as the U.S. is thinking about cutting rates, Japan is thinking about normalizing rates. What implication does this have for the currency? Um, the bond market there is so much about the BOJ that my concern is, and the concerns of traders, is that there's a disorderly unwind of this policy that's been so loose for so long. I love that you took us back to the early 2000s. You with bet. Steve Good Dyer. times. Yes, Good times. indeed. All right, <laughs> Professor Jared. Jared Blickery, thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's going to take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now, this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan, but I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about Four months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance, and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
This time last year, analysts were gloomy on what was in store for the stock market in 2023, especially given issues such as the war in Ukraine, the prospect of higher interest rates, and expectations of a recession. But this year, markets has defied investors' expectations here, and the S&P 500 up more than 18% year-to-date thanks to a strong outperformance among mega caps like Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. With more stock market bulls making the case for new highs in 2024, investors want to know, what are the best ways to play these anticipated gains in the year ahead? For a look ahead into 2024, we're joined by Althea Spinozzi, who is the Saxo Senior Fixed Income Strategist. And we've got Dave Mazza, who is the Roundhill Investments Chief Strategy Officer. Great to have you both here and an early happy holidays to you. Althea, I want to begin with you. If we're looking out to 2024 and dusting off the crystal ball to the extent that we may or it's out of the shop, what are the key things that investors should be watching for that could potentially propel the markets to some of the new highs that some out there are expecting? Well, it's not going to be different from 2023 in terms of what things to look out for. It's going to be inflation, growth, uh, and unemployment. And uh, realistically, uh, we believe that uh, inflation is going to have lesser important than, than importance than growth. Uh, throughout 2024, but central banks are going to be cautious about that. So right now, the market is pricing five interest rate cuts by the end of 2024. We believe that that's ahead of itself. And that what we are going to see probably at the beginning of 2024 is market pricing out some of those interest rate cuts. And that is likely to provoke another uh, uh, another rise in yields uh, that are going uh, to probably hit again 5% before the bond bull market begins. David, I want to ask you, what do you think about the Magnificent Seven and their setup for 2024? Is it still the place to be? I'd have to agree because I'd have to agree uh, with my fellow panelists' comments. The, if we take a massive step back, the economic background hasn't changed much. Uh, we know growth is slowing. We're hoping for a soft landing. Inflation is still high, but coming down. And the Federal Reserve and other central banks are going to be incredibly cautious about the, about cutting rates again to spur, I think, some of the euphoria that we saw before. So investors actually are likely going to continue to stick with what's worked, at least for the first half of 2024, and that's the Magnificent Seven. These companies, again, uh, there's a lot of naysayers out there about their valuations, but they offer incredibly high margins. They have stable pricing power. And they're more than just one business, right? Apple has many businesses. Alphabet has many businesses, Meta and the like. So we're, we think of them as just seven securities. But if you pick them apart, they offer a lot of different opportunities across the technology and consumer space. Althea, I want to also get some of your big predictions here as you're looking out to 2024 and, and perhaps some outliers that you're going to be tracking for. Well, yes. So I definitely want to look at the divergence between central banks in the meaning who's going to cut rates first. We believe that is going to be the ECB. Uh, but uh, realistically, that means uh, that the ECB might be welcoming uh, more inflation at home because commodities are quoted in U.S. dollars. Uh, so if the ECB is going to cut rates, the euro dollar the, will uh, fall uh, and that might reignite uh, inflation. And it's not going to be an easy task for the ECB in 2024 for the simple reason that Europe is already in a recession. So it's already the ECB fundamentally is already choosing inflation over growth. And if that divergence becomes increasingly next year, especially with the Fed and the ECB looking to cut rates and the Bank of Japan hiking them, uh, then it's going to be a volatile year. Uh, and David, I want to get some of your predictions as well. You have some outrageous market predictions for 2024. So take us through what yours are. Yeah, these are not my base case, but I think it's always fun to think about what could occur, and not just fun, but prudent. Um, and one in particular is around the presidential election. We just had a fourth uh, Republican presidential debate, and of course, uh, the lead candidate has not shown up for, for any of them, and he's still in the lead. But what's happening with the polling with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I think investors should uh, not ignore. 
Um, this is probably the first time going back to Ross Perot that we have someone who can credibly be perhaps a third party candidate. Now, um, it's not a clear path toward that, right? There's a, there's a lot that can happen between now and November, but we know increasingly, particularly as that simply the calendar turns to 2024, investors are going to start thinking about the election and the volatility that that could bring. Um, so I do think investors need to prepare for a particularly more volatile back half of 2024 than we've seen. Again, uh, I think there's going to be questions about when the Federal Reserve may start cutting rates. But I, honestly, what they tend up not doing is cutting right before an election season from a political standpoint. So I really have been advocating investors to keep an eye on this, regardless of your politics, um, because it's going to potentially play an impact on portfolios. And David, really quickly, I want to ask you one follow. You said this is not your base case. What are you looking for? What's the catalyst for a further breakout beyond just the strength of the Magnificent Seven? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think at some point, once we start uh, pricing in the actual opportunity for rate cuts at some point in a more material way, and I'm not talking about the moves that we saw this week. Um, some of that is a lot of short covering and reversals into small caps and non-profitable companies. What I'm really looking for is, do we get that material slowdown in the job market? It seems as though that hasn't happened yet, even with the most recent claims data and the uh, ADP data earlier this week. If that happens, then I do think we're going to see uh, the idea that we'll see smaller caps rally, we'll see unprofitable companies rally in a more material way. But until that happens, I think the economic environment is going to continue to favor the largest companies, the companies with high profit margins, and the ability to navigate what has become an uncertain economic environment. Indeed, and certain it is. All right, Althea Spinozzi, Saxo Senior Fixed Income Strategist, and of course, David Maza, Roundhill Investments Chief Strategy Officer. Thank you so much both for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, we want to take a look at the opening bell on Wall Street and do a quick check of the market action where uh, investors are going to get slightly off to the races this morning. We've seen investors cool their heels a bit this week ahead of uh, the jobs report this week. I mean, the jobs picture has been certainly in focus uh, for the entire week. I mean, we've had ADP out this week. We're seeing uh, the Dow start off a little bit higher with a gain of just shy of a quarter percent, better by 73 points there, S&P 500, uh, better by nearly half a percent, up 20 points. Uh, NASDAQ as well, getting off to the races as well, up 85. So you're seeing some gains ahead of the big jobs report that we will be watching for tomorrow. And we've, of course, got some new jobs data in today. Jobless claims, we'll get into that a little later. Uh, some bullish calls for the year ahead, but lots of headwinds on the horizon also. Barclays has entered the jet. It says markets could have the best of both worlds in 2024, even if the current rally may be overdone. And then there's City State. The U.S. economics team saying that the markets are reflecting a Goldilocks scenario in 2024 where activity and inflation cool gently to a sustainable pace. They do not share this optimistic outlook. So joining us now to discuss, we've got Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills. Maddie, help make sense of both of these calls <laughs> no. that we're getting. The bulls versus the bears yeah. here, yeah. right? I love a juxtaposition with the market commentary. I'm going to start it off with Barclays saying that uh, cue the Hannah Montana soundtrack, the best of both worlds for 2024. Wow, take us back. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That was for you. I know you like the music commentary <laughs> well, here. Uh, so they're saying that disinflation is going to make the Fed happy, but it's not going to be so much that it stalls growth. And that is obviously good news for markets. They do admit that there has been a little bit of FOMO that's leading maybe to too much much euphoria in the market rally, but they say that's not really going to matter when earnings support the fundamental uh, picture here that those magnificent seven stocks are going to continue to grow as we head into 2024 here. They also say that soft landing is the consensus view. Uh, defensive positioning also indicating potential for more upside. Investors could uh, chase the market even higher if they're positioned for a little bit of a downturn, but then we get some great news as the year heads forward here. Uh, and again, just adding there that there is a lot of potential for the upside, uh, even as we head into the end of the year with some question marks for the Fed. So to your point, yeah, you've got the bullish scenario and then you have the, I mean, I don't know if City would characterize it as bearish, but you do have on the one hand and then the other hand. Yeah. Um, and City doesn't agree with this Goldilocks tape that does seem to be a consensus. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see, you know, the, just the flip of that. 
Yeah, the city note kept mm. getting worse and worse, by the way, as I was reading it. I thought I had digested the bad news and then it kept getting worse because they say that even if the labor market uh, continues to look the way it has and to the point you were making earlier, Diane, we did get a little bit of that look in today's initial jobless claims staying at estimates. Mm -hmm. uh, so that does support city's view here that there's not going to be enough of a crack in the labor market to lead to disinflation. So we could see a recession. And we could also see, according to City, uh, disinflation not necessarily happening if we don't see that crack in the labor market. So I'm curious how they're kind of uh, putting those two together, because you do have to see chinks in the labor market yes. if you're going to get a recession call. Um, that said, this time of year for those initial jobless claims can be really choppy with the holidays. So mm -hmm. if you look at the four-week moving average of jobless claims, it is at the highest level in two years. So we're going to hopefully get more clarity on where this yeah. job market is at with the jobs report tomorrow. Yeah, which is a good point because the four-week moving average is often the point that you want to pinpoint in terms of that data. Um, all right, Madison, thank you for a deep dive as usual. We'll see who's right at the end of the all year right. next year. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully. Indeed. All right, we're also tracking AbbVie out here this morning. AbbVie acquiring Cerevelle Therapeutics today in a deal worth roughly $8.7 billion. This is the second large deal for the pharmaceutical company in just the past week. After it agreed to buy Immunogen, this is a cancer drug developer, and these deals come after Biosimilars, one of AbbVie's most lucrative anti-arthritis drugs, Humira, hit the market this year. For more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Anjali Kemlani. My God, the pronunciation. Anjali, they just come at you fast and furious when you're talking about these companies. Uh, well, you did a good job there, and you haven't had as much training as I have. It is Humira, but that is the drug, of course, that has set uh, the domino effect of, uh, or an example, rather, of the domino effect that we've seen with all these companies that are facing patent cliffs, a big pharma companies, uh, it, you know, looking out there to see what kind of M&A deals they can look at that won't necessarily grab the attention of the FTC. Uh, we did hear from AbbVie's executives just now on a call uh, uh, because of this deal, this 8.7 billion acquisition of Cerevel, additionally the 10 billion with Immunogen. Uh, that's really something that the company believes is all it needs to kind of boost the pipeline for right now. Executives said they're not looking for any larger late stage deals uh, for right now, but they will continue looking for smaller earlier stage deals. Uh, pretty confident that this is not going to uh, sort of raise eyebrows at the FTC with no major overlaps. Again, all of this coming from the company executives on a call this morning. So what that really sets up is a, a stronger pipeline for Avi as they've had to deal with the pressure from Humira. We have seen, of course, that they've had to trim their outlook. Humira hasn't necessarily taken the big hit that they assumed it would, uh, changing from about 37% down from 2022 to instead 35% down in sales from 2022. So far this year, netting 11 billion through the third quarter. We'll see what the fourth quarter holds. But as you can see, it's, or, it's only about half um, they have had sort of favorable positioning with insurers, so it hasn't over time necessarily done much to impact, and they've constantly beat Wall Street at Smith's on that product specifically. So AbbVie's story is kind of what we're seeing large scale in pharma right now with these large companies looking for deals that can bolster their pipeline as the peak of what will be a patent cliff in 2029 comes to a front. Important stuff there, especially when you think about the pipeline and the patents. Uh, we know that's key for that sector. Uh, Anjali Kamlani, thanks so much. All right, Dollar General out with its Q3 earnings today, maintaining its fiscal 2023 guidance, expecting net sales growth to be between one and a half and two and a half percent. As last quarter, the discount retailer did beat the street's revenue and adjusted EPS expectations. Same store sales fell, but net sales increased by 2.4 percent, which was largely driven by traffic into new stores. The company is citing inventory shrink as a significant headwind but pleased with sales trend, momentum, customer traffic, and market share gains. And you see it's being rewarded in the uh, early action 
up about two and a half percent on its shares. Oppenheimer already out with a note saying it's a better than feared uh, Q3 from Dollar General with encouraging actions to stabilize its business. We know earlier this year there was a C-suite shakeup as well. So that's certainly clearly helping put them on a better path now with the um, CEO saying uh, that while we're not satisfied with our financial results for the third quarter, mentioning obviously that inventory shrink they're pleased with this momentum in terms of the sale trends and positive customer traffic. Yeah, one of the other huge announcements that they mentioned within this is the growth of their real estate plans here. They are announcing today that their real estate growth plans for fiscal 2024 includes approximately 2,385 projects in total, 800 new stores, 1,500 remodels, 85 relocations as well, uh, which is actually a modest slowdown, they say, compared to the number of projects in recent years. So that's something that uh, investors should pay attention to as as well here because that could absolutely change the fabric of the number of doors that they operate at the end of the day. But then you think about some of the impacts in this quarter, most notably net sales increase, primarily driven by positive sales contributions from new stores, which is why I mentioned that new store growth and how important it is through that overall kind of growth metric there. But then also here, the decrease in same store sales, that actually was about 1.3% compared to the same quarter last year. So that noteworthy, and it was largely driven by decline in average transaction amounts. So the ticket shrinking a little bit here mm. at a time where they're growing out more of that store footprint to try and engage with more customers and perhaps grow out the overall base of customers that they're serving, but still in a period where they're seeing less of a transaction value per ticket per visit that a yeah. customer is making into the yeah. store. Yeah, and it's interesting to see that, especially when you think about just where inflation is, despite it coming down, Dollar General would be a play that, you know, you could see standing up in the face of continued sticky inflation uh, in terms of Oppenheimer's investment thesis. And again, you're seeing the stock rewarded today saying they continue to look favorably upon Dollar General's uh, longer term prospects. Um, they do believe, though, they do give this caveat. They believe that DG Dollar General remains a show me story. Mm. So uh, in terms of where it is today, we will see if this is a buy the rumor, sell the news kind of play. All right. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. AI has been the dominant theme in the market this year, with NVIDIA leading the charge. The stock is more than triple. AI enthusiasm has also contributed to tech leading market gains overall. But now it's raising questions about whether it's gotten too expensive. NVIDIA, for example, has a forward price to earnings ratio of 38 versus about 30 for the broader tech universe and 20 for the S&P 500. Does it belong in your portfolio? And if not, how do you play AI? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
Tech stocks have dominated markets in 2023, outperforming the other 493 stocks in the S&P 500. Heading into 2024, some investors are looking to branch out, seeking growth in other categories, possibly looking to add some sin to your portfolio. Might want to look at alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and gambling stocks. Our next guest says the best bet for 2024 is Constellation Brands. We have Vivian Azair, TD Cohen, Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst. So Vivian, thank you so much for joining us. Talk to us about the case for Constellation Brands. Sure, we think this is a story of accelerating EPS growth, which is why we upgraded the stock in September. They have leading brands with Modelo and Corona. Those brands do incredibly well with younger consumers. And we like to say your experimenter of today is your committed consumer of tomorrow. So our proprietary research shows that 18 to 34 year old consumers have an outsized preference for both of those brands, which should lead to durable market share gains. What, what kind of major shift in terms of taste profiles have we seen this year that could have perhaps a more outsized type of effect on, on how these stocks perform going into next year too? Well, it's been a very interesting year in U.S. beer, right, given the controversy around Bud Light. And certainly Constellation has been a net beneficiary of that. It's fueled big gains for Modelo. But Modelo as a brand has been on a multi-year share gain trajectory. It does incredibly well with Hispanic consumers. And so there's some really nice demographic tailwinds that should drive durable 7 to 9% growth for the beer business on the top line. And what about Molson Coors? What do you like there? Well, certainly they have been a net beneficiary of the dislocation with the um, ABI portfolio because while the market share losses have been concentrated in Bud Light, consumers were um, quick to figure out the rest of the brands in the portfolio, which created more broad-based challenges. So both Coors Light and Miller Light have been gaining share simultaneously. It's been many years since Molson Coors has been able to achieve that. Um, and I want to ask, I don't know if this comes up in your research, the impact of, say, the um, the GLP-1 discussion, and there's been talk about it impacting, you know, people's appetite for beverage. Uh, is that a headwind that is facing any of these uh, beer makers? Potentially. Um, if we assume that the early adopters of GLP-1s are higher income consumers, um, higher income consumers tend to over-index to wine, where we have been very vocal around kind of restraint with alcohol consumption is a combination of intentional abstinence, which we find to be outsized with younger consumers, you know, taking, you know, week or month long breaks, something like a sober October or dry January, as well as the interaction with cannabis. You know, the cannabis market is now $26 billion in revenues as of 2022. So that's, you know, over 10% of the alcohol market. And it's big enough now where we believe we're seeing dislocation away from alcohol sales into the legal cannabis market. And it's a way for consumers to take a break from alcohol by substituting it with cannabis. We see a particular trend with 18 to 25 year olds there's been over a decade long divergence where past month alcohol consumption with 18 to 25 year olds has been on the decline but pa reported past month cannabis incidents has been on the rise for a lot of these companies too i mean it's been a story of acquiring to grow are there any major kind of m a activities that we're anticipating to come about next year as you think about the brands that have done well as standalone that some of the larger ones out there the constellations that have a history of making some of these very strategic acquisitions might be eyeing in order to kind of grow out their portfolio you know 2022 is really interesting and really kind of over the course of since the pandemic we've actually seen a reversal in m a activity for beer specifically okay. where you had seen a lot of acquisitions of craft beer brands so you'll call constellations Constellation Brands had acquired Ballast Point. There were a number of craft beer acquisitions from ABI and Molson Coors as well. And we've actually seen an unwind of those assets. ABI, for instance, sold um, nine brands to Tilray, which is a Canadian-based can yeah. cannabis company, right? But they also own Sweetwater in Atlanta and Montauk, um, which is a craft beer offering in New York. So you actually have seen portfolio cleanup from the major operators. Where we have seen more bolt-on M&A is in the distilled spirits. Is there an expectation for growth in cannabis and which company is set up the best for 2024? Yeah, so um, we only model the cannabis industry from a you know from an industry mm -hmm. perspective yeah. as opposed to public company stocks, but we are looking for durable high single digit growth in the cannabis industry over the, the next five years. And that is driven by those consumer tailwinds. We have you know a growing number of states that have legalized. Ohio, of course, passed their um, voter referendum uh, with the most recent election. Um, so 
yeah, continued expansion of adult use marketplaces, but also continued adoption with consumers more broadly. What is the best way for executives, and, and we were talking earlier about some of the, the issues Bud Light has faced earlier this year. Executives are trying to figure out a, a myriad of different th things going into 2024, whether that be consumer taste profiles, whether that be how they navigate what is going to be from their vantage point a very vitriolic even election season where some of the issues that were present in 2023 could have lighter fluid thrown on them in some fashion or another. You know, where are you seeing the tone, the messaging come across from these executives that give you confidence in, in how you're evaluating them as well right now? I think from a marketing standpoint, everyone's talking about, you know, putting in like more oversight, mm -hmm. right, and being very careful about the messaging and really staying true to the brand. Um, generally, you haven't seen alcohol companies really dive into the political landscape. No. ABI did it yeah. in 2016 with the Bud Light Party campaign, if you guys remember that, with Amy Schumer and Seth Rogen, but that was a little bit of a one-off, and I would expect. Um, that companies in my space are a lot more focused on the health of the consumer and the amount of pricing that the consumer has had to absorb. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of price increases in 2022, and you can see that that pricing is normalizing in the back half of 23, which will create tougher comps as we head into 2024. Yeah, if anything, these are the companies that might help us get through another election season. <laughs> the the here. The drinking games. Vivian Azer, who's the TD Cowan Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst, joining us here on set. Great to see you, Vivian. Thank you. Thanks so much. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
According to AAA data, the national average price for gas is now sitting at $3.20. This marks the lowest price that we've seen since early January. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Inez Frey with more details on it. Hey, Inez. Yeah, Brad, and when you actually take a look at the big picture, you're seeing those gasoline averages $3.20. Well, the last time that gasoline was this low was at the beginning of January. In fact, this is the lowest really of the year because on January 1st, we saw gasoline averages at $3.21. So why have we seen this decline? Well, seasonal demand at this time is lower. You also are seeing that refineries have been ramping up their production after maintenance. So you are seeing a build of gasoline. And in fact, we had the EIA data showing that inventories for gasoline uh, last week were up uh, by more than 5 million uh, barrels. That is much more than had been anticipated. The, uh, the build was expected at 1.3 uh, million. So it kind of shows you the uh, amount of gasoline that has uh, been produced uh, recently. Now, where are gasoline prices going to be going through the rest of the year? They're expected to continue with this downtrend. Andy Lippo of Lippo Oil Associates told me that he's expecting gasoline to be lower by about five to seven cents in the coming weeks. In the coming week. Now, could you see $3 or under $3 per gallon in your state? 17 states already are seeing that average, but could we get there for a national average? It's possible. He's not predicting it right now, but it all depends on what will happen with oil prices, guys. Well, I certainly love the direction of that, personally. <laughs> uh, Inez, all right, I, I want to talk to you about another energy play that is, you know, directly impacted by the direction of crude oil. Talk to us about what's happening with diesel prices, Inez. Yeah, so diesel prices are also on the downtrend. And in fact, if you take a look at diesel prices last year compared to this year, on a percentage wise, diesel prices have actually come down even more than gasoline percentage wise. So you're looking at the average gallon of diesel at $4.16. Last year, it was $5.03. You have to keep in mind that diesel was in high demand in Europe. It's used quite a bit. And so when you had the Ukraine war, you also have had sort of Europe scrambling to get supply. So you had a lot of demand coming out of the Gulf Coast here in the U.S. for its diesel. But now you have Middle Eastern refineries that are putting more of that supply on the market. So that's part of the reason why you're also seeing diesel on a downward trend. Bottom line, guys, is that with the fight against inflation, these lower fuel prices will bode well when it comes to that. I like that. And as for Ray, thanks so much. Thank you. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's going to take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now, this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. Four months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
I'm Diane King Hall alongside the great Brad Smith. We begin this hour with stocks trying to gain some momentum ahead of tomorrow's payrolls report. Jobless claims increased less than expected last week, giving traders food for thought amid cooling economic indicators. Meantime, shares of software provider Sprinkler slumping this morning. Contract renewals slowed in the past quarter as customers deal with worsening macro headwinds. Even so, the company managed to beat expectations on revenue, hitting record profitability in the third quarter. We're also watching shares of C3 AI, the stock diving after it missed Wall Street forecasts for revenue growth. The company's sales outlook for the January quarter also falling short of expectation. Earlier this year, C3 AI withdrew guidance that it would become profitable by the end of 2024. Also taking a look at Take Two shares, the video game publisher was hit with a downgrade from buy to neutral at Bank of America. Analysts pointing to the assumption of a delayed launch for the widely anticipated video game Grand Theft Auto 6. Now, jobless claims last week were barely changed, with layoffs remaining at low levels. Wednesday also brought fresh signs of a labor slowdown with ADP's private payroll numbers. Next up, Friday's November jobs report. With us now to discuss is Mike Reed, RBC Capital Markets, U.S. economist. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. Um, let's talk about the latest numbers that we've gotten. Not so much jobless claims, weekly claims, because we know that's, you know, that's week by week. And yes, you have the four-week moving average. But what do do ADP's numbers tell you about what we can expect with the big report we're set to get from the government? Sure, good to be here, Diane. You know, if you do look at the ADP report, uh, that showed a consistent slowdown in hiring. Uh, but if you look at the details in terms of uh, sector employment, we saw trade, transportation, and utilities accounted for about half of that gain. So there, uh, you have seasonal hiring ahead of the holiday seasoning. Uh, ahead of the season um, that that shows indeed consumers are still spending. And one of the things that we've continued to hear, at least going into this report from some of the firms out there on Wall Street, is just where that consumer spending is expected to hold up and actually support some of the broader employment situation. How, how are you reading through that right now? Yeah, there are a few sectors that are still gaining quite strong. If you look at uh, health care, mm -hmm. retail spending. Uh, also uh, online spending. So there, that's where we would expect to see strength in transportation, for example. And then talk to us about what impact you're expecting to see in the November jobs report from this slew of strikes that we've been watching. Certainly. So if you look back last month, uh, we saw uh, manufacturing had a, a notable decline. That should be added back in. Uh, you also have the Screen Actors Guild strike that ended. So those uh, will indeed be added back in. However, it's worth noting uh, in terms of the unemployment rate, those workers are not counted as unemployed in the eyes of the household survey. So that will have no impact on the unemployment rate. One of the things that we've continued to hear from the Fed, and at least their positioning and evaluation of the employment situation, is that wages are not the largest driver of persistent inflation right now. H how are you guys evaluating the wage front? And even though we are still continuing to see increases, those increases are not nearly at the paces that we had seen even this time last year. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, you know a trend we've been keeping a close eye on. Wage growth has been slowing. And one sector in particular I've been pointing to uh, is the information sector, particularly within tech. So there we know uh, we saw notable layoffs throughout 2022. Uh, and if you looked at the past report, uh, their wage growth on a year-over-year -year basis was well below 2%. So I also want to bring into our conversation the JOLTS report, which was out earlier this week. Uh, what stands out to you in terms of is there sometimes some executives point out there's a mismatch in terms of the skills gap and um, the job openings that are out there. Uh, what stood out to you in terms of the direction of the JOLTS report? Sure. So we are expecting the, the JOLTS, uh, the job openings in particular, to continue to come down. Um, there are still some sectors that do need to recover in terms of their pre-COVID levels, notably leisure and hospitality. Um, but there, I think you have some structural issues, uh, namely geographic mismatches. So you have job openings in places where workers aren't necessarily located. I think you just said something really interesting I just wanted to double back to, especially within technology right now, because it seemed like when the entire kerfuffle and coup was taking place at OpenAI, there were a number of big tech firms that 
absolutely opened their doors and said, hey, whatever you are being paid there, we're willing to add on to that, either match it or even give you more in, in compensation one form or another. So it seems like even though the cuts have taken place uh, and that filtered through and impacted some of that wage figure as you were tracking it, it's also interesting because many of them are still holding perhaps a, a little bit of space for where there are key opportunities to take on employees for key areas that are growth parts of their business too. Uh, how, how could that perhaps have a broader impact as we go into next year and AI is still anticipated to be one of the larger themes too? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you think about the staffing structure of industries, um, it really comes down to occupations. So there, when you think about, say, software engineers or computer programmers, um, those are the types of jobs that are still in very high demand uh, and very hard to find workers with those particular skill sets. Um, where you do see job losses in the broader tech sector may not necessarily be within those occupations. And Mike, before we lose you, I want to get your prediction for the jobs report. What's your number for both sides? Sure, so we're looking for the headline payroll gain to come in around 185,000, um, but we are looking for the unemployment rate to tick up to 4%, um, and that would be in line with what we saw with the continued claims number ticking up throughout November. And if it does hit that level, what do you think that signals to the Fed? You know, I think for the Fed, um, they're still keeping an eye on inflation. Uh, we, we don't expect them to turn their focus to labor uh, just yet. We, we need inflation to come down uh, much more in line with their target. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time here with us today. Really appreciate the insight and the outlook going into 2024. RBC Capital Markets, U.S. Economist, Mike Reed. Appreciate Great. Thanks it. for having me. Thank you. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Big moment in the history of AMD releasing its new super high-powered AI chip. Let's get right to the person who has helped engineer a chip like this, of course, along with her team. That is uh, Dr. Lisa Su, chair and CEO of AMD. Uh, Lisa, always great to get some time with you. Wow, that presentation on stage, I think, blew a lot of minds, not only in markets, but also in, in the tech industry. So thank you for doing this. Let's start on something very, very simple. How do you put, and I think I got this number right, 153 billion transistors <laughs> on a chip? Explain it to the, uh, the commoners out there. Ryan, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for spending some time with us. Um, it's been a big, big day for AMD. I would say I'm so proud of the team we've done. Uh, it was really an, an opportunity for us to talk about just how important AI is uh, overall and then our products uh, within it. So yes, uh, you're absolutely right. MI300X, I said 153 billion transistors. Uh, it's the most complex uh, you know, chip we've ever built. It's the most complex chip, frankly, in the industry. And uh, the way you do it is, uh, let's call it, with a lot of technology. So um, we're super excited about about um, the capabilities of you know, MI300. Um, if you think about just how important AI has become, right? AI is like in every conversation, no matter which industry you're in, no matter what you're trying to do. And for AI, you need these extremely powerful uh, GPUs. And there are very, very few companies who can build these things. And um, I'm just um, you know, so, uh, so excited and really, um, you know, really, you know, love being part of uh, the opportunity to really change the industry uh, with our AI tech. How long does it take to come up with a chip that has 153 billion transistors on it? Well, uh, we've been working on this roadmap for over five years. I mean, these are the types of things, you know, you don't just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to build an AI chip. Um, but it's been a you know, steady progress, right? I mean, you know, you know very much what we've been able to do with our Epic product line for all of these large data centers and cloud um, installations. Uh, we're on our fourth generation with, you know, our Zen 4 technology. It's very similar on the GPU side. Uh, we're, we're launching our, what we call our third generation um, of our GPU architecture. Every generation, it gets better. Every generation, we work really closely with our customers and partners on how to make you know, their software better and how to make our systems better. So yeah, it takes um, quite a long time to do this. But what makes today so special is it's not just, you know, it's a great product because you know, great products come along um, uh, you know, all the time, but it's also a great product at the right time, solving the right problem uh, for the industry. And and that's where we are with AI. Um, AI is at the very beginning of adoption. And you know, what's become clear is you need compute. That's the foundation of AI. And that's what we're building with MI300X. So every one of those 153 billion transistors are helping us learn, helping compute learn, helping us answer questions, and um, you know, really deploying in, uh, in broad scale with a lot of our partners. So I'm watching you on stage, and I'm just blown away by some of these numbers. Look, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but all that seemed really like, wow, like this is some game-changing technology. How complex is it to manufacture these chips? And then how many, do you have an estimate on how many you will make next year? Yeah, absolutely, Brian. I mean, it is um, so many process steps. I mean, if you think about these um, MI300s, they're actually made up of 12 little chips. Uh, we call them chiplets in five and six nanometer technology. Um, we actually stack chips, um, you know, both uh, uh, horizontally as well as vertically. So we, you know, we bring um, you know chips on top of each other, and it takes about you know seven plus months, seven eight months to manufacture. So you know, when you start today, it takes seven or eight months before it comes out. So yeah, it takes a long time. Now, I have to say, we've been planning for this day. So, uh, you know, we're experts in the supply chain. I think in the semiconductor world, um, this is what we do. Uh, so we have, um, you know, significant supply um, that's uh, that's coming out in 2024. And we're working um, with a number of partners. You saw a number of them today, um, you know, so honored uh, to have, you know, Microsoft, Meta, Oracle, uh, Dell, Lenovo, Supermicro, a number of real, you know, AI, you know, really smart AI startups that are, uh, there. Um, and so uh, what we see is the ecosystem is hungry um, for this technology and, and we're ready for it. Lisa, are you just sold out? Uh, what's the backlog of sales look like for these chips? 
Well, uh, you know, Brian, what we said in our last conference call is that, uh, you know, we have very clear line of sight to, um, you know, $2 billion of revenue next year. Um, but we, what we also said is we plan for success. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, customer demand is very high. Uh, we continue to work with our customers to uh, deploy as quickly as possible. And we have much more supply than, uh, than $2 billion. So, you know, I, I do believe as we go through next year, uh, we'll be able to update those numbers. Wow, that's uh, some mind blowing stuff. Let's st stay on this thread of me not being a scientist. So I watched your whole presentation, I'm watching and I continue to watch it. And I came away thinking your chips will add more power to large langu language models. Help us understand what these chips will let these models do that they can't do today. Yeah, no, that's a great question, um, Brian. So, look, I think we've all, um, you know, really experienced how powerful ChatGPT and, and Copilot functions are um, in our personal lives, in our uh, businesses, in our enterprises. We're using it within AMD to build better chips. So that's where the technology is. Now, as you guys know, sometimes when you ask, um, you know, ChatGPT a question, it won't give you the quite the right answer because the model doesn't have, let's call it, um, all of the knowledge. Um, when you have larger models, when you actually train it on more information, it'll get more and more accurate. And so what we're working on is a technology for the next generation and the next generation. And what we're trying to do is to make this AI technology so easy to use, but so powerful that it makes all of our daily lives better. So more compute will allow you to train better models. They'll be smarter. And it'll also allow you to get answers much more quickly. So you don't have to wait. You know, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay between when you ask the question and when you actually get the answer. Uh, we're building these chips so that that delay is as short as possible. And you can bring that computing technology everywhere you go, like it, including in your PCs, for example. So if we're having this conversation a year from now, what are these models doing that they aren't doing today? I, I think the most important thing, Brian, is we want them to be right. Mm -hmm. We want them to be as good as possible. We want them to help us answer questions as quickly as possible. And uh, we want the answer to be um, the right answer. And so these models are going to get much more accurate. Um, they're going to be much more tuned to your data, um, you know, particularly when you think about your, your own personal space or your own enterprise space. And for that, you need lots and lots of GPUs. Today, um, you know, it is one of those constrained resources. You know, our job is to make the technology better and ensure that there's plenty of opportunity for, um, you know, all companies uh, to have uh, access um, to this great technology. You've seen a lot of different uh, advances in technology throughout the course of your career. I was thinking, I think you mentioned this on stage too, the, the creation or the start of the internet. Uh, are companies putting in the, the right safeguards um, to protect society from these large language models, given how fast things are moving in this? You know, I would say that this moment is, um, you know, just uh, unlike any other moment. So, you know, I've been in this industry, you know, 30 plus years. We've seen a lot of great technology, um, but AI is um, is a step function above that in terms of what we believe the potential is. Now, we do have to put in safeguards. Um, I think there's a lot of work going on um, in that uh, area, uh, but the upside, you know, far outweighs um, the potential uh, risks. And, you know, as technology companies, uh, we're all in this together to ensure that the technology is rolled out in a, a very productive and capable as well as safe way. There's been a lot, a lot of discussion since we last spoke, Lisa, on sending AI chips to China. What is your position on this? Well, I mean, from an overall standpoint, um, you know, we certainly spend a lot of time with the administration. Uh, we understand the importance of the export control uh, regulations uh, to, you know, ensure that we're keeping uh, the most advanced technologies um, in the United States, and we we, we absolutely um, understand that. That being the case, um, China is also an important market, and we have a lot of great partners there. And so, I think the key is, um, you know, we plan to have a portfolio, and you know, in that portfolio, we are going to be, um, you know, extremely, um, you know, focused on ensuring that, uh, you know, we have, you know, sort of bleeding edge technology, and then we also have a broad portfolio for um, all applications. And our thanks to Brian Sazi for that in-depth interview with Lisa Su, AMD CEO. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Here's a live look at Wall Street.
Barclays Technology Conference is underway in San Francisco. Top business leaders are coming together to discuss all things artificial intelligence as we look to big investment ideas and themes in the new year. Yahoo Finance's Shauna Smith is on the ground talking to attendees about what's driving tech into 2024. Juniper Networks is ramping up its focus on AI. Now the technology has really become a cornerstone to the company's strategy. They're using it to drive long-term growth and also improve profitability. Here to discuss that and much more, we want to bring in Rami Rahim. He's the CEO of Juniper Networks. So Rami, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Shauna. So let's talk about those AI investments because that really has been the hype word, the word that everyone, the buzzword that people have focused on uh, over the last 12 months. In terms of what it's done for Juniper's business, what are you seeing? So AI is definitely not a new thing for Juniper. We've actually been investing in this technology for the last five years. Mm -hmm. Our AI-driven enterprise business has been performing phenomenally well. In fact, our mystified, what we call our mystified solution, which is driven by AI technology that's essentially enabling us to run networks more efficiently, delight our network operators, delight the end user, has grown over the last report, two reported quarters approximately 100% year over year. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen by accident. We're taking share at an unprecedented rate, and this is proof that AI is not just in its hype cycle, it's proof that AI is actually delivering real results for our end customers. So because of that, you are already seeing a return. You're seeing the impact from AI, your investments there on your revenue. How is that then shaping your strategy going forward, those future AI initiatives? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So thus far where we have benefited is in what we call AI operations. We have an AI engine that's driving network operations and improving the experience to the end customer and to the network operator. The future, I think we continue to do that. We will continue to benefit from the differentiation that we're seeing through AI, but we add yet another area of investment that I think can represent a multi-billion dollar opportunity, and that's around the AI infrastructure, right? Anybody that is leveraging AI needs to essentially tap into large clusters of GPUs that are connected through networking. Mm -hmm. Juniper is really good at building high performance, highly efficient, highly reliable networks, and we're doing that to capture this clustering opportunity for the AI infrastructure in the future. That's a next new big opportunity for our company. And because of maybe some of these initiatives, you also had recently announced a bit of a restructuring. It also included layoffs. What's your message to investors in terms of why this makes sense, some of the strategy, some of the uh, moves that you have uh, done so far, why that makes sense for Juniper in the long run? Yeah, we had to do a, a, a relatively small restructuring effort. We obviously um, don't like to do these things, but we do them for a couple of reasons. One is we are committed to not just growth, but profitable growth for our investors. But even more importantly is to ensure that we're investing on the right side of industry change. Mm. So essentially we are investing and hiring in new areas around cloud delivered uh, capabilities, AI technologies, data science that will ensure that our solutions are going to be differentiated today and in the future. When it comes to some of the strength that you've been seeing in your business, enterprise really sticking out, especially uh, in your most recent quarter, in terms of that momentum as we look ahead to next year, what do you see? So the investments in AI have mostly today benefited our enterprise business. Mm -hmm. And Juniper has traditionally been known as a company that serves service providers and cloud providers. Mm -hmm. In the last reported quarter in Q3, enterprise for the first time in the company's history became over 50% of total revenue. Uh, and I expect that enterprise will continue to grow faster than any other of our segments. That's great because right now, our superpower as a company is the diversity of our business. We don't just rely on one or two market uh, verticals. We rely on three key customer verticals, service provider, cloud provider, and enterprise. And that gives us the resilience to overcome any industry headwinds and macro challenges that might affect one or two of those verticals. Talk to us a little bit more about some of those macro challenges, the fact that there's so much uncertainty looking ahead to next year and beyond. As a CEO of Juniper, how are you evaluating, or I guess how are you approaching that uncertainty in terms of some of the decisions that you're making? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, again, I think our superpower is our diversity. And right now, for example, cloud providers and service providers are experiencing 
a, a period of headwinds because they're digesting a massive amount of infrastructure that they have bought over the last several years. They need to consume it, to deploy it, and so on. Enterprise, relatively speaking, is much more robust. And for that reason, we were relying on enterprise, which again now represents the bulk of our business, to achieve sustainable long-term revenue growth. And Rami, one of the uh, topics, topic points that came up on your most recent earnings call was inventory. The levels that you're seeing there, elevated uh, inventory levels. In terms of that normalizing, what yeah. does the timeline look like for that? Yeah, so next year revenue growth will be muted because mm -hmm. of the fact that much of this year's revenue growth has been from the depletion of that inventory. I think as you get into next year, inventory levels should be sort of back to normal. And at that mm -hmm. point, orders will start to recover, which is why we expect orders across the board and all of our customer verticals to recover meaningfully next year. As you look ahead to 2024, what would you say or can you identify maybe the biggest risk or some of the biggest challenges that are ahead for Juniper? I honestly feel really good about our competitive position. Our differentiation that we enjoy hasn't been this strong since the birth of our company um, that I was fortunate enough to see you know, mm -hmm. uh, close to 30 years ago. Um, it's those factors that are outside of our control. How long will it take for the digestion period and the cloud provider and service provider to play out? You know, I am very confident that cloud providers will need to eventually invest in their networks. It's just going to take a bit of time, uh, and that timing is a little bit uncertain right now. Rami Rahim, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here, CEO of Juniper Networks. Thanks so much. All right, our thanks to Shauna Smith, who was at the Barclays Technology Conference with that wide-ranging interview with Juniper CEO Rami Rahim. Meantime, artificial intelligence has taken the limelight this year, but not everyone is buying into the hype. The EU is taking charge on AI regulation this week. After a near 24-hour negotiation, regulators will continue drafting the most comprehensive AI regulation on Friday. For more on what we can expect from the act, Yahoo Finance Dan Howley is here with us to break it on down, uh, break it all down, I should say. Uh, Dan, it, it seems like these were pretty tense negotiations. So what are we looking for? Uh, come Friday. Yeah, this was, uh, like, you, like you said, a, a marathon negotiating session on Wednesday with the EU over these AI regulations. Going into Friday, you can expect them to continue to try to hash out some of the disagreements that they currently have. Uh, this was something that was uh, put together in 2021 before uh, OpenAI had released ChatGPT, before Microsoft was on board uh, with its own co-pilots prior to Google's release of uh, its BARD software, uh, you know, I mean, before the big Gen AI explosion. Uh, the fact that the, the technology is changing so quickly, uh, so recently though, uh, it's kind of throwing uh, a wrench into the work. So just to, to break it down, the EU's original proposals have AI broken down into a, a few categories. The first is unacceptable risk in which uh, countries would not be able to use AI. Those include things like uh, social scoring, where you would classify people based on their behavior, socioeconomic status, uh, personal characteristics, things like that, uh, real-time uh, biometric identification systems, and then uh, behavioral manipulation. So uh, one of the examples the, the EU puts is uh, uh, voice-activated toys that would encourage dangerous behavior in children. So uh, think of I guess a nefarious tickle me Elmo or something like that. Uh, high risk systems would be those uh, that have biometric identifications, uh, education and training, things along those lines. Those would have to be uh, monitored by the EU uh, and then uh, continually checked out. Uh, generative AI is on this list uh, of items, uh, but they would basically just have to disclose what's going on uh, with the uh, actual platforms to EU regulators. And there's just limited risk uh, AI systems those they would have to get looked at and then kind of allowed to, to function. Now, the, the hangups here for uh, the EU that, that's you know being hashed out now are over those uh, biometric the, uh, uh, capabilities. Governments don't want them, uh, but uh, some members of government do, uh, particularly law enforcement, military, they want to be able to, to use those kinds of AI systems. Uh, so that's a, a sticking point. The other is on generative AI systems that are open source. So if you have an open source system, it basically means you have the source code out in, in the world. Um, generally, that idea is that they're supposed to be safer because everybody has eyes on them. Uh, it's not a proprietary system. You can say, you know, okay, researchers around the world, take a look. Uh, so uh, France and Germany uh, have come forward and said, look, we, we don't think that 
um, the open source systems need to be regulated as heavily. Uh, so we kind of want to pull that back. Uh, there's disagreements on that as well. The, the big deal here, though, is that this would be, uh, as you said, one of the, the most comprehensive AI laws in the world. Um, you know, China does have AI laws already. Uh, this would go a step further. Uh, it would also give the EU, once again, uh, a, a leg up on the US, which still doesn't have privacy regulations, uh, federal privacy regulations when it comes to, to the web. We They have that already uh, in the EU, and now they would do that again uh, with AI, ensuring that uh, there's some form of protection uh, against the use of the technology. The U.S. still woefully behind. So, you know, if they can't get this sorted out uh, rather soon, they're going to go into elections, uh, and then we likely wouldn't see this take shape. Again, this was started in 2021, so it's something that they really need to get on. Yeah, especially if they're thinking about talking about protections, even within figurine dolls and whatnot. At least a few people within the EU must have seen that Ashley O episode of Black Mirror featuring Miley Cyrus. Dan, we'll see what comes of this going forward here. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Dan. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. CEOs of the nation's largest banks were questioned Wednesday by senators for three hours in Congress's annual oversight hearing of Wall Street. The executives warned lawmakers that the Federal Reserve's proposed higher capital requirements will harm consumers and the economy. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonberger talked to one Democrat who thinks the CEOs may be right. Jennifer, take us through uh, your conversation. Good morning. I sat down with Democratic Senator Mark Warner last night for reaction to bank CEO's comments. I asked him whether he shares executives' concerns that the Fed's proposed capital requirements could hurt lending and consumers. He told me the banks have an argument this time, and he's been told by regulators a lot of revisions are coming to that plan. Take a listen. My friends in the banking industry, whenever there's a new reg regulation or rule, they always say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. This time, though, um, I think they've got uh, an argument. Uh, I think that um, you've got the circumstance where interest rates are at a recent high. The idea of additional capital requirements, an additional buffer beyond what's already in place, 
will mean there'll be less capital available for lending. And when you've got even civil rights organizations saying this is not the right time, um, and I've been told by the regulators that they have a lot of revisions, but mm -hmm. you know, so I'm going to be anxious to see how this plays out. But I do think they have some concerns that um, ought to be heard out. At the same time, though, I, I get a little frustrated with them at times because there are other tools that could deal with issues like liquidity. If we go back to the very beginnings of the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. when it was first created, there was what's called the discount window, mm -hmm. where if you've got a bank that's got a liquidity issue, you would go to that discount window. As a matter of fact, two of the major failures this year, SVB and Signature, mm -hmm. didn't even know how to use that tool. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've been exploring is, you know, I know banks are reluctant to use it because it comes with a stigma, mm -hmm. but you can't complain about other regulations if they don't use existing tools. So could we have a requirement uh, that on some level of random basis so that there was this, you had to demonstrate that you knew how to use the window and can I work with the banking community so they can use that window in a way that doesn't create a stigma, doesn't hurt their stock price, but also is a, frankly, a tool on liquidity that was set up in the first place. If regulators don't make changes up to your liking, that you still feel like it's going to impede the economy, credit availability, the consumer, mm -hmm. what is the prospect if that rule does pass close to its current form that you could enact the Congressional Review Act to stop implementation and would you support I that? I know that a whole lot of my uh, Republican friends have already are, are making that threat. I, I, I felt like it was like kind of yin and yang at the hearing. You had some people saying, you know, these banks have created every problem in capitalism. You've got the other group saying the regulators have created all these problems. I'm not, frankly, in either camp. I'm going to reserve judgment until I see what this final rule looks like, how many revisions are made, and then we can have that conversation. All right, switching gears slightly, I want to ask you about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You've expressed concern that it could disrupt capital markets. I know you have some legislation mm -hmm. that you're working on that would designate the Financial Stability Oversight Council right. to look at those AI-related mm -hmm. risks. Uh, what can you tell us about that? What well, does that include? Well, remember, AI right now, without even the next generation, could completely disrupt trust in public markets through deep fakes, through the appearance of fake securities filings, through you know misinformation about products. I'm amazed that we've not seen more manipulation. And because artificial intelligence touches potentially so many parts of the market, it seems in my mind the FSOC, which was created out of the 2008 financial crisis, which brings together the head of all the regulatory entities, that can look across the whole landscape would be a good place <clears throat> to charge that group with recommendations. Now, let me be the first to acknowledge, FSOC's record of taking on big issues has been a little bit mixed, mm -hmm. but boy, oh boy, this seems like a tailor-made problem for them to take on. And what we were looking at is, you know, could they come up with regulations, make sure Congress still has a say, but have those regulations or um, ideas implemented uh, with, again, appropriate congressional review. When do you think we could actually see legislation on AI move forward? Uh, I know you have put forth right. legislative proposals. I know Leader Schumer has said this is a top priority. When can we see some of this enacted? Well, I, I think, one, it has to be bipartisan. And that's I'm talking with a lot of my Republican colleagues. Mm -hmm. And I think the two areas where AI could be most disruptive is, one, we've talked about public markets. Mm -hmm. But also, we come with a presidential and congressional elections next year. You could have huge manipulation in an election. So those would be areas that I think we should start. Some of the more grandiose schemes that we're going to come up with an entire framework, mm -hmm. I think that may be too ambitious. Again, I've got the scars from trying to, you know, I've got a dozen different bipartisan bills around social media and not a single one has passed. So I'm a little less ambitious in terms of what we can pass in the short term. Speaking of social media, uh, TikTok has received major criticism in the wake of the Israel-Hamas war for uh, the feeling that they put forth pro-Palestinian content and perhaps anti-Semitic content. This, of course, on top of fears from lawmakers uh, that perhaps China is able to use this app to spy on the U.S. As the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, would you be in favor of banning TikTok? Well, I actually had legislation earlier this year called the Restrict Act. 13 Republicans, 13 Democrats, completely bipartisan, the administration supported, that wouldn't specifically ban TikTok. I think we need a framework, though, 
they would give the Commerce Department the ability for technologies that are ultimately controlled by foreign adversarial powers, countries like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, to have a process. TikTok would still get its day in court, but we don't even have a way to kind of grapple with it. And we were moving along smoothly until TikTok spent about $100 million on advertising and lobbying. We had the far left and the far right attack us. But I do think TikTok's a challenge. I mean, it's, there's a lot of creativity on TikTok. I just wish it wasn't, at the end of the day, controlled by the Communist Party of China. And my big thanks to Senator Mark Warner for that interview. Brad, I'll send it back to you in New York. All right, Jennifer, thanks so much. Uh, great conversation there. A lot of insights really extrapolated from it. Appreciate it. Well, we're getting a major labor market download this weekend. The reports so far show a significant loosening in the once tight job market. As job openings decline, more consumers may be inclined to pinch their pennies in the coming months. So how is this impacting big ticket consumer discretionary businesses? We heard from retailers like Lowe's and Best Buy a few weeks ago that big ticket purchases are falling. But home furnishing brand Lovesack is still seeing category outperformance. Lovesack reported a 14% increase in net sales in its third quarter and says that it is pleased with the start of the holiday season. We've got with us here today, Sean Nelson, Lovesack CEO, with us to discuss these results. Sean, great to see you. Would love to dive into what you're seeing this quarter and, and how you would describe the consumer right now. Yeah, look, it's a mixed bag in the sense that I think that we're all watching the same news. The world is... Uh, has all sorts of chaotic elements at the moment. And I think that people, you know, we, we call them consumers, but people in general uh, sometimes feel a bit nervous and uh, worried about these high interest rates, you know, have a hard time figuring out what their next move is. If they need to move, you know, it's hard for them to sell their homes, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of money on the sidelines right now. I think there's a lot of people who feel nervous in general. At the same time, the world marches on. You know, I learned this uh, back in 2008, 9, 10, still in the home furnishings business, even way back then. Love Sack uh, grew and grew through that recession because, you know, while business curtailed 10, 20%, let's say generally, uh, the other 80% still marches on. And uh, I think that's in a way what's happening now. It's, it's unique for the home category because we're experiencing a big hangover after COVID. But then again, it's unique for Love Sack because we've been on such a uh, uptick as we've built the brand over these past few years very intensely and uh, had a lot of success. So, um, you know, we're kind of a standout in our category, but uh, which is which is again, experiencing severe headwinds, the home category in general, as you just mentioned. But, uh, you know, we're, we're glad to be doing okay. So, Sean, I, I want to ask you about, so uh, you had some double-digit growth there, especially when you look at your revenue number uh, in your latest quarter and your outlook for uh, Q4 and for 2024. In particular, I want to hone in on 2024. Um, it looks strong. You're projecting net sales in the range of 710 to 720 uh, million uh, for fiscal year 2024. What are the assumptions that are behind that projection? Yeah, so so our fiscal 2024 is the year that's that's ending in uh, you know let's say 60 days from now, um, because we're on that right. uh, January end calendar. But looking beyond that to the following year, which is what I'm guessing you're asking about, mm -hmm. is uh, is still a bit unknown. You know, we haven't put out guidance for the coming year. We do expect growth for the year in balance. You know, we will end with probably the highest growth in our category, which of course we're very proud of. At the same time, it's our lowest growth in, in quite a while because, you know, we, before this, I think we were on an eight or nine year CAGR uh, above, you know, between 30 and 40 percent growth. It's just been a tear for Love Sack as we built the brand. But, um, you know, so so this is uh, this is a, a softer year for us, but um, a strong year for the category versus our category. So in the balance of year, look, we're being cautious on the consumer through the holiday. We had a great Black Friday. Uh, for sure, but um, you know, there's just a lot swirling in the world, so we're we're maintaining a lot of caution in general. Sean, we, we've come a long way. The business has come a long way since the days where you and I were actually sitting on Love Sacks in Times Square, <laughs> yes. just kicking back, chatting. And this was before the company even went public. You think to how the business has grown out now and some of these new product initiatives that we've heard you talk about, whether it's angled sides, whether it's partnerships with Microsoft's Xbox. At the end of the day. How are you seeing consumers gravitate towards the different products that Lovesack is pulling out now? And is there kind of a sweet spot within that new 
type of demographic, the, the consumer that you're seeing come into the brand? Absolutely. Look, Love Sack uh, is a, a leader in innovation and we don't do a ton of things, but the things we do, as you can see, are very innovative, got complete embedded surround sound system, charge your phone invisibly, all hidden inside of our couches. No one has that patented by Love Sack. As we continue to put out new products that allow people who bought their Love Sack couch pieces, their sectionals, let's say even years ago, like when we met, um, to add the angled side on to add stealth tech on is very satisfying and look it, it pays off to that sustainability minded consumer who uh whether or not they are recycling themselves you know it makes them feel good to know that they've bought something that has real value and that can be sustained hyphenable a product that can actually last and last and as innovation comes out does not obsolete it and i think in that way we're, we're flying in the face of so many tech companies so many product companies that uh engineer things to fail we're going the opposite direction and i think that's a big part of our success so sean we had this internal chat about some serious subjects and um and of course the song popped up in our conversation yesterday you know what song the um, love shack yes i'm not gonna sing it i'm not it. gonna sing no because <laughs> i'm not gonna sing it but what it does bring you sing it no uh what it does bring up for for us is this question about your marketing and or discounting strategy that you may have to employ as you think about how consumers are uh, becoming more discretionary and pinching pennies and deciding where they're going to spend their dollars. Are you having to make any changes with regard to your marketing and or discounting strategy? So broadly at retail right now, discounts are extremely high, especially in the home category where you have many firms struggling to keep up uh, you know, with growth in this, at, this, in, at this time. That certainly affects us. We certainly are navigating that surgically. Our sales come from a built up pipeline of customers who are interested in our products because they are so unique, right? Like there's nothing quite like our products and m most of them are patented. You know, you can't find anything exactly like it. So thankfully we discount less than all of our peers that we're observing. Um, we've driven our gross margins up by 900 basis points this last quarter. I mean, it, you know, they're in the they're in the high 50s, which for our category is extremely high, highest in the category, I think. And uh, thankfully, we've been able to walk that knife's edge. We are discounting more this season than we were last year, but less than our peers. And I think broadly, that's the knife's edge we we hope to continue to walk on. At the same time, we do expect uh, that promotional environment to continue to be aggressive. Uh, throughout the balance of this year through January for us and and even on into next year. I think, look, there's a lot of headwinds to the home category right now from this post-COVID hangover. We don't deny that. In fact, um, it's uh, it, by what we can observe worse than 2008, 9, 10. Again, thankfully, Love Sacks built its brand in a way that gives us momentum to grow through this even as it's tougher than it was before. All right, Sean Nelson, standing up in the face of the changes in uh, your industry. We appreciate your time. CEO of Love Sack, not Love Shack, baby. Love Shack. That's right. <laughs> All right, I, I gave a, a little bit. <laughs> If I had a dollar for each time. But you hear that, I'm sure. Appreciate it. I love you. Love you guys. All right. Take, take care. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
All right, time to get cosmic. No, not more talk on SpaceX this time. We'll save that for Rochelle Akufo in the next hour. We are talking about Cosmic, McDonald's new spinoff brand launching in Boilingbrook, Illinois this week. Cosmic was originally a McDonald's mascot from the 1980s, and he took the form of an alien from outer space who loves McDonald's food. Cosmic not as well known as some other mascots, like this guy, Grimace. But maybe he's set for a comeback if things go well with this venture. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma joins us now. Okay, so if Grimace, as the CMO of McDonald's has told us, represents happiness and joy, what does Cosmic represent here, Brooke? Cosmic is this out of this world experience okay. that McDonald's is really hoping to win fans over with. Now they did tease it back in July, this small restaurant concept that has the DNA of McDonald's, but its own unique Unique personality, that personality we now know, cosmic, that outer space alien character. Now they're intending to solve the 3 p.m. slump here, they said, with customizable drinks. You have those sweet and savory treats. They're testing out different options or different layouts. As you can see here, they have multiple drive through lanes. It'll give customers the opportunity to pay with a credit card at the, the order speaker, and then they'll be able to choose, or rather McDonald's Cosmic employees will tell them which pickup lane to go to in order to increase speed and efficiency. So if your order is a bit more complex, perhaps you'll go to another window. Now this is just one location launching this week near their headquarters in Illinois, but nine others are set to launch in the first half of 2024 in Texas. And this is all just a pilot. McDonald's will assess it for a year, and see where it goes. So speaking of this being a pilot, is this a, an attempt to say take on a Starbucks or something like that? Yeah, that is the question. I think that many analysts, many investors are certainly wondering that, but McDonald's CEO did say that, you know, don't get too excited here. It's just 10 stores. He said this is more so about the potential that McDonald's has to, to build another concept, but you can't help but think of Starbucks really looking to get customers in the door during that two to three, you know, the afternoon hour. Of course, you also have Dutch Bros. You have Wendy's that serves coffee all day. You also have restaurant brands, international brands, like a Tim Hortons. You have a Dunkin'. So really looking to test this new concept and perhaps, you know, go up against the big guys who know the space very well. We will see if they can really achieve what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. All right, Brooke De Palma, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, that is all from us from, from us today. Uh, Rochelle Okunfo has you in the next hour.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. The final frontier. For Star Trek fans, that space. For Elon Musk's SpaceX, it could be a stock market listing. Reports of another tender offer valuing the company at $175 billion will no doubt reignite that conversation. We'll dive into it this hour. And patent problems. President Biden's administration says it has the authority to license some drug patents if the price is too high. It could mean big changes for the industry and the potential for some serious blowback. And we deep dive on a classic company that's been making some major changes. We hear from Barnes & Noble, one of the oldest book retailers in the United States, on how it revamped its business and how it plans to beat out the competition going forward. But first, let's check in on the major indices an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at the Dow, relatively flat there, up about 50 points on the day though. The S&P 500 there, in positive territory, up about 30 points or 0.7%. We're seeing communication services, the leader there, healthcare, the only S&P 500 sector in the red so far this morning. And looking at the tech heavy Nasdaq there, up 151 points or just over 1%. Let's also check in on the Treasury market as, of course, we await that big job data that's going to be coming out this week as well. Looking at the shortest term five year, that's up about 0.4% on the day. The 10 year up 0.8%, sitting at 4.15, though still a far cry from the five market was at earlier in the year. And looking at the longest term 30 year, that's currently up about one, just over 1% 1 on the day. Well, could an IPO finally be in the stars for Elon Musk's SpaceX? Well, that debate has been reignited. According to Bloomberg, the company has initiated discussions about selling insider shares at a price that values SpaceX at $175 billion or more. Now, this comes amid rumblings of a possible spin-off and IPO of the company's Starlink satellite business in 2024. Now, Starlink is by far the largest revenue driver for SpaceX. Bloomberg has reported that the company is eyeing $15 billion Billion in revenue in 2024, thanks mostly to its satellite launch business. Now, SpaceX's Starlink owns over 5,000 satellites orbiting Earth and providing high speed internet to over 60 countries, rivaling the likes of Amazon's Project Kuiper, among others. Well, let's talk more about this with Chris Quilty, co CEO and president of Quilty Space, a subscription based satellite and space sector business intelligence company. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So, thank you. Talk about some of the talk about some of the interest here that you're seeing from pe the clients that you're talking to, especially when it comes to Starlink. Yeah, so traditionally Starlink was primarily viewed as a launch company and most of the companies in the industry uh, had a very favorable view. Uh, they were lowering launch costs, increasing launch access. The shift to uh, Starlink, however, has shifted somewhat of the competitive balance. Uh, they're now competing with many of their customers that they use to launch. 
Uh, they're growing that business from what had been a consumer focus into many of the, the core enterprise markets that sustain uh, the existing satellite communications industry. And they've been moving fast, uh, moving into areas like uh, in-flight connectivity, the maritime market, other enterprise applications. And they've also eaten into what is a large part of the, uh, the industry's business in the government. Uh, in general, uh, prior to the launch of Starlink, about two thirds of their revenue was coming from government customers. Uh, they've got some big programs that they're also working with the uh, Space Development Agency, uh, with NASA, and that'll continue to be a large part of it. But for uh, you know the rumors around IPOs or spinoffs and, and the valuation discussions, uh, the value is going to come from the Starlink side of the business, and that's where they've been growing and putting a lot of their emphasis uh, in the last year or two. And as you think about how much we saw that come into play in Ukraine with the Russian invasion there, it, it really does also raise some ethical questions about having so much power concentrated with one particular company. How are, some of the, how are you viewing some of the ethics in this when you think about Starlink's impact here and how investors are viewing that? Well, it, it's a tough issue, right? Um, uh, Elon Musk uh, has been mercurial, mercurial at times. Uh, certainly cutting off uh, access in Ukraine was something that opened the eyes of, of many companies and many uh, government officials around uh, the access to that service, which has become pretty vital for the U.S. military and certainly Ukraine. It's a unique capability. Nobody else can offer it today, though they do have a competitor in OneWeb. Uh, that is starting to launch services. So there is at least one alternative. But you know, I guess the challenge here is for SpaceX, they need to walk a thin line be between providing the service that the government customers want and being sure that they don't overstep their bounds uh, in restricting that. And you've seen competitors, uh, including OneWeb and certainly Amazon as they come on, will probably make some pretty distinct policies around uh, how they provide government service to avoid that effect and in some ways to, to try to draw those customers over from Starlink. And Chris, you raise an interesting point about some of these collaborators that SpaceX had could potentially end up becoming competitors in this space. But break down the different sorts of satellites and things that we're talking about here, because you have some that are about internet connectivity, others that, as we mentioned, in terms of military applications as well. Who are Starlink's competitors in those spaces? Uh, so on the launch side of the business, um, you've heard people bandy around the word monopoly. They're not a monopoly. There are other launch providers, uh, but they certainly have a dominant position in the market. And uh, although in the launch market, it has historically been a, a fairly static uh, industry over the years, we're seeing incredible growth. I mean, just earlier this month, they took down a, a nearly billion dollar contract from a competitor Telesat, that uh, had no other option but to launch on SpaceX. There just simply aren't any heavy lift launch vehicles on the market today. Now, there might be in 26 when, when uh, Telesat begins to launch. There should be. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Amazon paid about $10 billion to buy 83 heavy lift launches, uh, and that's to get their Kuiper constellation on orbit. And that sucked the capacity out of the industry. So right now, if you're looking to launch anywhere from 2024 to 2027, um, you know, it, it's basically SpaceX for most customers. And then there are some foreign launch providers. You might be able to get a, a Japanese MH3 or, you know, something with India. But uh, Russia's out of the market and the Europeans are, are struggling with bringing their new launch capability online. And in fact, they've been forced to buy launches from SpaceX as has Amazon uh, just recently. So then, Chris, when you think about where investment goes from here, I mean, different sorts of space investment. We've been also tracking what's been happening with Virgin Galactic pulling back there. So where are the most lucrative spaces that perhaps other companies could try and get into since SpaceX is so dominant in this space, in the launch space? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say SpaceX has been an incredible boon for this industry and what they've done with launch costs. I mean, look, the reason we're undergoing a space renaissance today is that basically launch costs had been unchanged at ten dollars to $20,000 a kilogram for 50 years. And SpaceX has bringing that, brought that down. You can buy for $6,500 a kilogram, you know, a rideshare launch. You can buy an entire rocket and drive your launch costs down to, you know, about $1,500 if you launch with a Falcon Heavy. It's lowering those launch costs that have suddenly enabled people to look at business models, whether it's manufacturing in space or building a data center on the moon. And suddenly the economics work, like the launch costs have gotten to a point 
where new business models are possible. We just published a report and we looked at over 350 constellations that are planned. Most of these have some level of funding. Many of them are you know, uh, well on the way, uh, generating revenue. And that's going to drive about 20,000 satellites that need to get launched before the end of the decade. SpaceX is going to grab a big chunk of that. And uh, we haven't talked about Starship. Uh, that could take up a lot of capacity. But you know, the, the problem here is right now, in the near term, we're in, we're in a bit of a constrained environment for launch. And so many of these companies that need to build out constellations, raise capital, uh, they're, uh, in, to some degree, being slowed down in their ability to get to revenue uh, because the launch environment has become so tight. Uh, the satellite communications industry, which is the largest traditional industry here, is what SpaceX is targeting uh, with the Starlink. Uh, but to put it in perspective, and I know you're going to ask the question, uh, you know, the, the rumors around valuation going up here, um, I, I can't confirm them, but I've just seen the news articles. The biggest challenge for them is that the entire satellite communications industry is only around $25 billion in revenue. And if you're looking at $150 or $170 billion valuation for Starlink, you have to square that circle with the fact that they've got a launch business that historically has been about $5 billion a year and a telecom business in Starlink that, you know, fair enough, if you take some of the largest uh, telecoms in the world from you know, NTT, Deutsche Telekom, T-Mobile, Verizon, those companies have like 110 to $180 billion valuation. So you can kind of get there if you believe they can grow to that scale. Uh, they would certainly be the first company in the, the satellite industry uh, to move out to, you know, large uh, enterprise uh, tr traditional markets that were served by terrestrial fiber. And they, in fact, mm. think and will need to compete with many of those markets if they want to grow to the size that they're projecting. Certainly a fascinating space to be in and the, the potential for disruption here across several industries, certainly apparent. Appreciate you taking the time to join me this morning. Chris Quilty, co-CEO and president of Quilty Space. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, investors are keeping an eye on Japan, where the central bank's governor issued a few comments on Thursday that may mean the country is set to exit from the ultra-low interest rates it has had for decades now. Meanwhile, markets are pricing in rate cuts next year for the Fed, as well as the European Central Bank and the Bank of England. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, who is tracking the impact of these rate bets. Hey, Jared. Hi there. We are tracking this in the Forex market. That's foreign exchange where we see everything here is the Japanese yen crossed with other pairs across the world. We have uh, the number one gainer here, actually the gainer versus a Mexican peso. That's up nearly 3%. Then we have the Swiss franc. Then we have the Argentine peso. We have the U.S. dollar here. Uh, the Japanese yen doesn't move this quick. In fact, most foreign currency pairs do not move this much in one day. This is very upsetting for a lot of uh, traders here. Uh, let's take a look at the year to date. Now, first, I'm presenting this pair in inverse order. I just wanted to get a good comp where we could show the Japanese yen versus everything here. Uh, but the yen has been weakening all year long. And if you take a look at a three year chart, it's actually been weakening. It's lost a quarter of its value to the U.S. dollar. And uh, let's examine exactly exactly why that is. Now here I have global interest rates. This is the, the, uh, the Fed funds, the ECB deposit rate, the Japan policy rate. So these are the short term interest rates of these three banks going back to the global financial crisis. And you can see most of the policy rates after the global financial crisis were around zero. And then we had Japan experimented with negative rates. Um, and that's where they still are. And the ECB experimented with them too. However, the ECB lifted off, so did the Fed. And then with these higher interest rates in the United States, that encourages all these capital flows into the US dollar from the yen in order to be able to take advantage of it. So that's why the yen was weakening. Now that it looks like the Bank of Japan is going to be strengthening next year, and perhaps even this year, um, traders are going a little bit, I would say they're trying to uh, shuffle their books to align with reality here. These are global yield curves. This is Japan, US, and Euro. And the one thing about Japan is it's still upwardly sloping. This is exactly what you expect in a yield curve where longer dated uh, tenors command a higher interest rate. But that's only because the Bank of Japan has been artificially keeping rates very, very low on the short end of the curve. So the big question for traders is what happens when you get that lift off? Is it going to be an orderly unwind or a disorderly one? And uh, I would share 
aware that it's probably uh, becoming disorderly. And that's what we're seeing because this is the odds of a rake hike for the J Bank of Japan at their December meeting in about two weeks here. Those have been shooting up. Now, it was thought only a few days ago that this was not a live meeting. This was not a meeting at which the Bank of Japan would have to raise rates. However, bond vigilantes are telling them another story. And we're seeing this huge move in the currency market today as a result. Um, we don't know exactly when the, Japan, when the Bank of Japan is going to have to normalize, but this is probably going to be one of the bigger stories of 2024, especially in the early goings here. Uh, interest rates affect everything else. If Japan raises their interest rate, I want to show you what happens in the U.S. The U.S. Uh, rates actually lower because global funds are competing for demand of, uh, of the highest interest rate all around the world. So today, as a result of all these moves in the Japanese yen, we're actually seeing an increase of about three basis points in the 10-year T-note yield. If uh, Japan explicitly raises their rates, that's going to shoot higher. And we know that higher rates in the U.S present problems for stocks. So all of this is engaged in a giant feedback loop. We've had ultra low weight rates in Japan for a long time. And uh, concerns for traders are how orderly or disorderly is going to be a policy normalization. A question for the new year, but maybe, maybe now in December. Indeed, it's one of those things that one of those factors when we're looking at what the Fed can do and some of the things outside of their control. Definitely one to watch. Appreciate that breakdown. Our very own Jaron Blickery. Well, central bank policy will play a large role in market moves in 2024. Now, we want to deep dive deeper into the bets investors are making on those rate forecasts with Omar Aguilar, Schwab Asset Management CEO and CIO. So, Omar, the Bank of Japan seems like it may be leaning towards a rate hike this month, which would end years of negative rates. Can you break down this decision and the impact it could have on markets? Yes. No, thank you very much um, for having me today. And uh, it is quite of a, an interesting discussion in in the markets. It seems like uh, you know people are you know discounting the labor market report for tomorrow more than what is happening you know overseas and with the potential decision of you know the end of an era. You know the the potential of a rate hike in Japan changes a policy they have had for decades, and and you know, getting out of negative rates clearly makes a big uh, change in how the different the dynamics go in, in, in global markets. Um, you know, a few things to just note in terms of this decision, I think, uh, I think was pointed out earlier, the weakness of the yen over the course of the last several years relative to other currencies, you know, has always something that the, the, the Bank of Japan has actually seen as something good uh, in terms of just maintaining the stability of their economy. And that was on the heels of something that is very important for the Bank of Japan, Bank of Japan which is keeping inflation levels, you know, below the 2%, they always like it. Now, for the last 18 months, you know, the, the, the rate of inflation in Japan has actually surpassed that 2% level. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have had several discussions with the union laborers. They have changes in the way that they look with auto workers. And therefore, that has actually put wage growth, you know, at a lot of pressure that peaked inflation in Japan in, in levels that they haven't seen in a long time. When you put that in the context of, you know, what it was described before, that the, re the rest of the world other central banks, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, are, have actually been very aggressive in raising rates. That obviously puts Japan in a very difficult position, and therefore, you know, they're ending, you know, their um, policy for negative rates as well as the yield curve control that they have implemented for a while. So, what does that do? It puts pressure on global yields for sure. I think, you know, competition for for bonds you know, will be there, and therefore, puts more pressure in the U.S. bonds. It clearly provide a very nice potential for a yen appreciation going forward, because on the flip side, as the Bank of Japan is trying to raise rates, we see the rest of the central banks potentially cutting rates. So that provides a little bit of a tailwind for, for an appreciation of the currency in Japan. You know, at the same time, would also potentially put a floor into the potential outperformance of Japanese stocks. And with that in mind, also looking at the correlation between the, the movement that we've seen with the yen and the impact that it's had on U.S. bond yields, at least so far this morning on some of that news, what should we expect in terms of volatility in the U.S. bond market? 
Well, that's the, that has been the uh, the theme of the year, or probably the theme of the last two years, where you know global bond yields and particularly U.S. yields have actually been incredibly volatile and have actually been responsible for a lot of the volatility we have seen in equity markets. You know, we we expect that to continue uh, at least until we get the final you know statement by the Federal Reserve that will be their pause and and the potential for talking about a more dovish um, you know conversations. So we expect that you know yield to continue to be volatile. You just think about it. Not too long ago, we were talking about a five percent ten year yield, and now we're talking about four four uh, fifteen you know ten year yield. In a very short period of time, we have seen these big swings in yields. That obviously has been as a result of you know what has happened with the economy. Clearly, the positive news about inflation, as well as the potential that you know the Fed will end their rate hiking cycle, which will you know pave you know for an economic recovery down the road. And you know that it's important at this time to stay disciplined, not jump on every single data point that comes out. So but you also say you can use this volatility to rebalance your portfolio in a tax efficient way. How should someone go about doing that? Yes, uh, great question. And, you know, this is this is an important part of the year. And, and we're in this sort of transition period because, you know, we are very close, if not at the end of the Fed rising cycle. So when you get to the end of the tightening cycle, usually what you see, you expect more volatility within asset classes. So we expect more dispersion among individual stocks. We expect more dispersion among sectors. We also expect in the fixed income market a shift because as the short part of the curve expects you know, that lower yields, we see the potential of normalization of that yield curve inversion that we have had over the years. So when you see these dynamics all working out, together, there is a clear opportunity for, you know, short-term volatility that will allow investors to take losses and harvest losses in some of their positions and replace those losses with similar asset classes or similar investment vehicles that gives them the exposure to the asset class, but at the same time provides a fresh starting look so that they don't necessarily have to do it. So if you if you have seen, for example, the volatility that you saw back, you know, in 2022 with energy, um, you know, outperforming and this year energy underperforming, you see those swings, those are great opportunities for investors to potentially change a vehicle that is similar to the one maintaining the exposure to the sector, to the stock or the stocks of the type, and then at the same time, take advantage of the potential harvesting of losses. Certainly important as we, you know, end, end this year and if people look ahead to tax season as well. Omar Aguilar, I appreciate you joining me this morning. Schwab Asset Management CEO and CIO. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, reduce, reuse, recycle. That's what our science teachers taught us, but is it enough? I talked to a recycling expert about the impact it has on the environment and how corporations are stepping up next.
It's been a tough year for the pharma industry, starting with the Medicare drug price negotiations, then the FTC sending warning letters to stop excessive patents to pharma companies. And just this week, the White House deciding it has the authority to license the patents of certain medications to lower patient costs. Well, for more on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Anjali Kemlani is here. A bit a very busy season indeed for pharma. It certainly has, Rochelle. And it's important to point out that these are, uh, you know, actions by the government that have been discussed for quite some time. Medicare drug pricing negotiations first to hit the, the industry with those 10 selected drugs, followed by the FTC calling out certain companies for their asthma uh, inhalers and other devices, as well as EpiPens. So that has been another area of focus for the FTC, in addition to what we've seen with, uh, you know, challenging some of the M&A activity that we saw, notably Amgen and Horizon, as well as Pfizer and Seagen deals this year. So uh, again, big focus for the FTC to kind of curb what they see as pharma's powers. Then this week, with the White House announcing that it's going to look into what uh, was an older act that put into place what is known as margin rights. That's from the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, which allowed basically any inventor or a holder of inventions the right to, do, uh, with development of federal dollars, the right to grant licenses for the inventions to a third party. And that's basically what the White House is looking to do through the NIH. Now, it's important to point out that the White House is looking at this because of the cost of drugs. They cited that in what their guidance would be. And that is an interesting point to some experts because for the longest time, uh, there has been discussion about whether or, whether or not price could be used as justification to look at licensing. That's something that the prior administration had looked to try and block from happening. Clearly, this administration is taking a completely different stance. So all told, a really rough year for the industry with the government trying to curb their power and costs for Americans. It's important to point out that a lot of these are sort of limited in impact. They do involve some of the largest companies and uh, in some cases, Medicare drug pricing hitting some uh, at, at the same time as the FTC uh, action. So some of these companies are sort of hitting it from multiple, getting hit from multiple sides. Um, but in order for the government to sort of move forward, there, there definitely has to be more focus uh, on these smaller attempts. That's the only way that they can do it. The uh, screen you just saw was a list of some of the drugs that have been developed uh, with public funding, most notably, if you recall, Moderna's COVID vaccine. That was one that really started this conversation back during the pandemic times. But there's also other examples like HIV drugs from Gilead. So. All told, an interesting time to kind of watch how many of these actions pan out. Indeed, and we'll have to see how that impacts R&D spending and implications there as well for some of these companies. Appreciate you as always, our very own Anjali Kemlani. Thanks so much. Well, divisions at COP28 in Dubai over the future of fossil fuels and which countries should foot the bill, well, that continues. It comes as a record number of fossil fuel reps attend. So where does that leave corporations? Well, nearly all of the chemicals used to make plastic use fossil fuels. Enter a new U.S. center reducing the need to create new plastics. Now, the Republic Services Polymer Center is opening in Las Vegas this week. It's expected to produce more than 100 million pounds of recycled plastic each year for packaging and other applications. The center already has a big name customer on the, on the, de on the dock here. Well, Republic Services CEO John van der Ark is here to tell us more. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, John. So I want to first start with the, this big name here because people think of plastic, they maybe think of packaging, but talk about Coca-Cola here. Yeah, obviously, we collect a lot of plastics. We pick up something 5 million times every day, and a big chunk of what we pick up is recycling, and that's, you know, cardboard and plastics are the two biggest commodities. Most of plastics today gets downcycled. So think of your water bottle, detergent bottle, milk jug. That's going to go into pipes, park benches, uh, carpets, which is good. It's not going to go in the landfill, but at the end of the life of that product, it's going to end up in the landfill. And what the polymer center really unlocks is for us to get to true circularity. So turning that detergent bottle back into the detergent bottle, 
or the water bottle or the beverage bottle back into the beverage bottle. And that's where Coca-Cola comes in. Obviously, they've made some pretty bold commitments around using recycled plastics in their products. And the Polymer Center is a huge enabler to help them reach their targets. And how difficult is it when some of these some of these targets, they are voluntary. Some of these companies are doing this of their own accord, trying to push for sustainability here. But talk about some of the partnerships that you're making with companies and how incentivized some of your clients are. Yeah, I think it's both voluntary. It's also regulatory. So you see states, you see California, Washington, New Jersey, they're putting in mandates that by 2025, you need 15% post-consumer content that ramps up to about 50% by 2030. So both of the things are at play. And listen, there's a lot of demand for this product because the market short supplied. So we could have sold out our Las Vegas center probably five times over. Uh, if we wanted to, people are lining up because the market is short supplied on truly food grade recycled PET or recycled HDPE. And that's what this center unlocks. So so talk about recycled plastic and how it's made and, and how you see that really contributing to the circular economy here when we think of the future of how we can reduce fossil fuel use. Yeah, so what we do today is we take that recycled plastic out of our 75 recycling centers and our West Coast operations will flow through Las Vegas and we'll have three more of these centers over the next few years. And uh, it sorts all of that plastics, the HDP and the PET, separates them and gets color sorting. And then it really does hot washing and cleaning and then eventually pelletizes it. And then that can go right into the bottlers or the other manufacturers, right back into food grade product. No one has ever done this before in the United States. And it's a big investment. We're going to spend $75 million in Las Vegas and $300 million across the country in these four centers uh, to get this product where it needs. And again, it's good for the environment. It's good for our shareholders as well. We think we're going to have a positive return on this as well. So talk about some of the returns, because you mentioned the, the investment in this space. What sort of returns are you seeing so far? And what are the expectations going forward? Yeah, we think we're going to have north of our company EBITDA margin average on this product. So north of 30 percent and uh, rates of return you know, in the mid teens. So these are really attractive investments and ties right into our belief that in order to be economically sustainable or environmentally sustainable, you have to be economically sustainable. Those two things have to go hand in hand. Right. If you want to do good, you have to be profitable over time, which allows us to reinvest. And broadly, we're trying to challenge every ton that goes into one of our landfills and think, could we do something different with it? Could we have a second life for that product, which is, again, good for our revenue, good for our shareholders, and also allows us to preserve that valuable landfill space for future generations? And so then when you look at some of the resistance that you're getting on, you know, obviously you have a lot of companies reliant on fossil fuels. And when you look at some of that resistance, what do you think is going to be the tipping point to perhaps encourage or speed up the energy transition? Yeah, I think what we're, we, we're, we're pro on is multiple solutions. So lots of people talking about banding single-use plastics, and I would encourage somebody to live their life for any period of time without single use plastics, it'd be pretty challenging. So plastics are gonna be with us for a while. And we think we need to work on this challenge on every front. So mechanical recycling, chemical recycling, material substitution and packaging design, uh, any all the way to really creative things like enzymes that could eat plastics, which we think over time, longer term period of time could be viable. So we're not uh, locked in any one solution. We know there's a single use plastics problem and we want to be part of the solution. And there's a lot of talking and we favor doing. So that's why we're voting with our feet, with our wallet to start arresting the trend on climate change and seeing if we can make a difference. And certainly be, will be welcome news for investors who are looking to perhaps get into this space and really seeing what the what that part of revenue would look like for them as they invest here too. Appreciate you joining us this morning. John van der Ark, Republic Services CEO. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, the Barclays Global Tech Conference is underway in San Francisco. Yahoo Finance's Shauna Smith is speaking with the CEO of Cato Networks about AI's impact.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. Two of the dominating themes here at Barclays Global Tech Conference is AI and cybersecurity. So let's talk a little bit more about how AI is reshaping the cybersecurity landscape and also what we could expect in terms of some of the themes for cybersecurity in the new year. I want to bring in Shlomo Kramer. He's a co-founder and CEO of Cato Networks. Shlomo, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about the impact of AI on cybersecurity. Right. What exactly has that impact been so far? So I think the um, uh, two dimensions to the impact. One is new types of attacks, mm -hmm. right? Mainly a deep fake and how do you know this is real or not? That's becoming a much bigger problem with an AI. And the second is just industrialization of attacks, right? So if it's a human being behind the attack, there's a certain pace to the attack. If it's an AI machine, that becomes much faster and much broader, much more quickly. So really the defenses needs to keep pace with both new types of attack and new scale of attacks. And how are you doing that at Cato Networks? By using AI, of course. Which is so interesting. So when we talk about the fact that we are using AI to kind of fend off some of the risk that AI Why? poses, how are you doing that? And I guess in real time, how much more effective is it for you at Cato Networks in terms of recognizing some of those attacks? So first of all, AI for us is not new at Cato Networks. Mm -hmm. We've been using AI since day one as a cloud service, as a, the largest uh, a SASE provider in the world. We use the AI from day one to collect all the data from our customers and run algorithms and find uh, attacks. So this is uh, uh, just a continuation, and now with the large language models, which is the next generation of AI, this is very much part of our uh, roadmap and what we embed uh, uh, in our solution. So, so that's uh, uh, an ongoing, like a red queen race, if you want. You have to run as fast as you can in order to stay in the same p uh, place against the uh, attackers. And how would you categorize, you're a veteran of the industry, you've been around for many right. new breakthroughs, many new technologies. In terms of what AI is doing to your industry, more broadly speaking, touching almost every single industry, comparing that to some of the innovations in the past, how does it stack up? That stacks up with the iPhone and with the personal computer and with the internet, I think. That's at, at that level of uh, um, importance. So absolutely, that's a real revolution and we are just beginning that revolution. When it comes to demand for your business, your business has grown dramatically over the last several right. years. Right now you have about 150 million, I believe, in recur annual recurring revenue. More than that, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so you have than, more than that. More than 2,000 enterprise customers, yeah. So, so going off of that in terms of how quickly you've been able to scale your business, what's the next step, do you think, for Cato Networks? I think that f uh, for us, we are uh, both going up market mm -hmm. and delivering the powerful simplicity of SaaS to larger and larger enterprises, and we are expanding uh, the value of our platform. Really, uh, more capabilities delivered with zero TCO to our existing customers, so we can really partner and be more strategic for them. And when it comes to some of those partnerships, even some of your customers here, you have a bunch of uh, very recognizable names when it comes to Carlsberg, Porsche, Formula E, Ring right. Central. In terms of their priorities, where they right. lie, what are you hearing from them just in terms of the biggest risks that they are a bit fearful of and how you then can help mitigate some of those risks? You know what? I think that the, the biggest risk for them is mm -hmm. complexity. Is the, I don't know if any, uh, if you have uh, been to the RSA show and mm -hmm. saw all the thousands of boots uh, that uh, now you need to consume all these point solutions, mm -hmm. the complexity is the danger. And when the CIO of Carlsberg uh, tells me that we are the Apple of uh, network security, that tells everything. It's all about the how and the how to consume all of these capabilities more than exactly uh, the what. The what is there, the how is not there in cybersecurity. So what does that mean then just in terms of growth then, the opportunity that lies ahead, the fact that, the, right. that there is such a need for this and it almost right. sounds like we're still very much in the early innings. Exactly, so it's all about the platform, right? And, and delivering a platform that can uh, bring more and more what, more and more capabilities without additional cost and additional complexity. Uh, to the customers, and that's the uh, uh, division of SaaS in general and Cato in particular. 
And so you've been around the industry for quite some time, very successful in terms of your previous uh, entrepreneurship companies that you founded, taken public, Checkpoint Software, Imperva, both of those companies you have taken public. Do you have plans to do that for Cato? So I think that Cato is, can be a very large, leading, next generation security company. And uh, uh, going public is a milestone in that direction. So we're definitely preparing the company uh, uh, to be a public company. Is it something that you're maybe considering for 2024? It really depends on the market. You know, uh, we can do so much about our execution, but the market also needs to be there. Shlomo Kramer, great to get some time with you Thank here you today. Very Thanks much. so much, uh, CEO and co-founder of Cato Networks. Thank you. And thanks to our very own Shauna Smith for that interview. All right, well, stay with us. A new chapter for Barnes & Noble. CEO James Daunt joins us next with more on the bookstore's behemoth turnaround plan. That's coming up after the break. It's been a tough few years for bookstores. Sales tanked in 2020 following years of decline between 2008 and 2019, according to the Federal Reserve. Now, headwinds from the likes of Amazon, the emergence of e-commerce and the COVID-19 pandemic weighed heavy on the industry. Enter Barnes & Noble, one of the oldest book retailers in the United States. Now, the company is reinventing and revamping its business to dodge the pitfalls threatening bookstores. So how does the company continue its quest for growth? Well, let's bring in Barnes & Noble CEO James Daunt to discuss more. Welcome to the show, James. So, so talk about how Barnes & Noble is revamping and restructuring to really meet the needs of today's book lovers and consumers really by being very, very old fashioned and um, backing the principle that if you run a very good bookstore, people will come into it. And the better that bookstore is and the more focused it is on books, the more customers you'll have and the better you'll do. Um, and uh, it's sort of helpful that we're also investing in the stores, making them more beautiful. Uh, but it's really about the booksellers uh, within them um, and giving them the freedom to curate their, their stores in an interesting way. So talk about that, because so for people who haven't been into a Barnes and Noble, who sort of had really converted online, what should they expect now versus the Barnes and Noble that they used to know, say, pre-Amazon and, and pre-pandemic? I think pre, um, pre-pandemic, it was sort of very much a, a, a pilot high um, a type of retailer and, and trying to run the same bookstore everywhere, um, really, as most conventional retailers try to do, 
And that works if you're selling sneakers or clothes or thing, uh, you're, you're a pharmacy chain. But a bookstore should be very reflected of, it, of its local customer base and the community in which it sits. And the people who can judge that, I've always felt, are the, the booksellers. So we've given them a real freedom to do that. Also, you will find um, plenty of things that, that we believe sit alongside books very nicely, educational toys, you know, greetings cards, wrapping paper, those kind of things. But you're not going to find any more uh, what did rather dominate the stores in the past, which is all, all just stuff we hoped to sell. Um, and that all of that's gone now. Um, and I think we've cleaned it up. We've made it much more uh, enticing, much more interesting to be in. Um, and given, as I say, this sort of autonomy to the booksellers to really uh, run their stores um, as intelligently as they're able. So when you look at the sort of consumer spending that you're that you're seeing on books now, especially as you know people are tightening tightening their purse strings at the moment during inflation and trying to look for perhaps other sort of resellers looking for cheaper options here, how is Barnes and Noble managing things like discounting and pricing to keep consumers coming in? Well, well I, I come from actually an independent bookstore background. That's my where I started out. And as an independent bookseller, you're in, you're in quite a tough space. As a very large bookseller, we can um, afford to do a lot of discounting, the multi buys. You know, buy one get the half, one half price, and all of all of those things. But really, at the end of the day, it's it's about creating enticing spaces. Um, and books are very good value, certainly very good value compared to most other ways in which people um, spend their leisure time. Um, it's much more expensive to go to the movies, uh, much certainly a lot more expensive to go to restaurants and the like. Uh, so books are very good value. And, and we've had this tremendous um, upsurge of reading um, during the pandemic, and that's been sustained post pandemic. So books are very, very popular at the moment. Now, I do want to ask about some of some of the headwinds that we're seeing here. I mean, 2023 has been a, a year for labor unions. We have seen that push. Barnes and Noble not, not exempt from that push as well. How are you managing sort of helping, you know, employees and, and booksellers with the cost of living while also keeping in mind, you know, people are pulling back on some of their spending or perhaps down spending or perhaps looking for cheaper alternatives? Well, we're lucky because our sales are continuing to, to rise. Um, and I think as long as we continue to offer better bookstores, the sales will hopefully keep on uh, on increasing as we increase our sales. And um, it's how then responsibly and sensibly we use that profit. Part of it is on improving the business. Part of it is on opening new stores. Uh, but a, a large part of it has to be on pay for our employees, the booksellers who are driving this. And it's trying to create a balance between you know, the competing demands all of which are very important to drive a business forward. Um, but pay is very important. And as you say, um, quite rightly, uh, there's, there's a demand from those at the lower end of the scale to, to, to have more. And so as you look at some of the other trends, we've, we've talked about labor unions, but also changing consumers. You, you can't think about marketing and advertising without thinking about social media and, of course, TikTok, very prominent. When you're taking this neighborhood approach to bookstores, how are you gauging sort of that content, drawing perhaps new uh, customers into the line, but also gauging how, how you're tracking that, how you're able to predict some of these trends as well, especially going into the holidays? Well, I think we're sort of, again, counterintuitively, where we've pulled back entirely from trying to do it from a central perspective. I think doing it from New York City makes very little sense if you're running stores all over the country. But what we have done is empower uh, the, the local booksellers and each individual store to run its own social media platforms to engage, be it Instagram, Pinterest, as you say, TikTok, whichever, uh, and indeed, probably all of those, um, and to do so in a way that is sort of sensible and engaging for, for the local community. Luckily, we employ lots of young people, and they're dramatically better at doing it than people with gray hair like me. Um, and it has been actually successful for us, um, but very varied, very inventive, sometimes very funny, and helpfully so far, only very occasionally getting us into trouble. Um, but it's, it is not trying to control it corporately. It's just let it roll. And James, I have to ask you, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, I'm, I'm always reading. Um, I, I belatedly and have just finished um, the Heaven and, and, and Earth grocery store, the James McBride, which I absolutely recommend to everybody. It is the most fantastic mm -hmm. novel. They, they come along you know, every few years and, and we've got a wonderful one. Uh, and it is one of our books of the year. The wager which you have up there is is also a really, really good read. Um, Grisham, I haven't got to yet. 
And uh, I noticed that um, don't let the pigeon drive the sleigh. That's one of my, my five-year-old nephew's favorites. I see that's one of those 20 to 23 books for Barnes & Noble as well. Appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Barnes & Noble CEO, James Daunt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, well, Lego Group and Epic Games have joined forces just in time before the holidays for an ultimate gaming experience. Now, Lego Fortnite is the new survival crafting game that allows players to play and build in an imaginary world. Yahoo Finance tech editor Dan Howley is all over this for us. So, Dan, you were able to test out the game prior to its launch. Tell us about this experience and your main takeaways from this game. That's right, Rochelle. My job is incredibly difficult. Uh, you know, some people go to war zones. I go to... <laughs> areas in New York where I play video games for a few hours. This is uh, a lot of fun, actually. It's it's Lego teaming up with Fortnite Epic Games. Uh, basically, there's there's two versions of this. It's it's inside Fortnite, right? So you have Fortnite, and then there's this kind of like new metaverse thing that they're starting where they have a Lego game on its own, uh, they have a racing game on its own, and then they have a rhythm game on its own. Uh, fun fact, the rhythm game is made uh, by Harmonix, the people that were behind Guitar Hero years and years ago. Um, but the, the Lego side of things, it's, it's basically, as you said, a, a crafting survival game where the idea is you have to collect resources around the world, food, you have to uh, eat, you have to uh, build shelter, keep yourself warm. Uh, you know, it's it's basically kind of camping, but in a, a video game. And you do this using Lego blocks. So you go around chopping down trees and you pick up uh, pieces of what would be uh, Lego wood. Uh, Lego says that they've taken uh, a, a huge number of the actual Lego pieces that they design in, in their, their own uh, facilities and then transferred them into this this Fortnite game uh, for Lego Fortnite. So you're really building with actual uh, uh, Lego pieces. It really is quite inventive. So I just you know get, have a few takeaways after playing it for uh, a few minutes. Uh, the big thing is it, it's expansive. Uh, you can literally see snow capped mountains in the background. Uh, I was standing near a lake, saw these snow capped mountains. I could just walk there. Uh, you know, uh, it's several kilometers large, this world that you can just build up. You can invite friends uh, to join your world online. You can give them basically keys to your little kingdom and they can jump on if you're not online at the time. Uh, and you can kind of defend yourselves from various, you know, nefarious uh, uh, characters in the game as well. Uh, there's also the fact that this is marrying two absolutely massive franchises. I mean, Fortnite is just outrageously large. Uh, everybody knows about it. I, I happen to not be a Fortnite player. I play other games, but you know, I know about it. I've, I've played it before. And then Lego, I mean, come on, who doesn't know what Legos are? I was uh, reminiscing about playing with my old Lego pirate set as a kid and had the little uh, <laughs> Lego alligator there. And then the, the third thing is that it's gonna pull gamers into Lego uh, and Lego, users into games so it's it's marrying these two but it's also going to make sure that there's crossover uh which i think is very important i i think this kind of game lends itself very well to the world of fortnite importantly as lego points out uh, there's a lot of protections for kids so you know there's not going to be uh the kind of mad dash online activity that you might have uh with something like fortnite this is more geared towards uh younger users as well as older users there's also i want to point out a sandbox mode where you can just get lego pieces in the game and build whatever you want and then walk around that so i don't know if you want to build a, a version of the taj mahal you can do that and then walk around the inside of it based on how you want to build it and it does seem like a perfect partnership because my daughter, she loves building in Roblox. She loves Minecraft and loves Lego. So it, it seems perfect. So then as we speak about this, then how does this compare to rivals like Minecraft? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because as I was playing it, I was like, well, this is going right up against one of the largest games ever in Minecraft. Right. You know, that that is on virtually every platform you can think of. Um, and, you know, there's a whole generation of, of kids who came up with that as their their go-to game. So it, it definitely has uh, its work cut out for it as far as competition goes. Uh, I think, though, you know, the aesthetic is, is very different from Minecraft. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be blocks in Minecraft. Lego, you're, you're building with Legos, but it just looks a little bit cleaner. Um, I, I do think that it's going to have that advantage, obviously, from Fortnite, 
players who want something different but don't necessarily want to have to jump into a different game. Uh, it's it's also important to point out this is free still. Uh, just as, as Fortnite is free, this is free to play. Uh, and so you'll be able to jump on uh, from the Fortnite main screen, just dive in. So it's not as though this is going to be something that's uh, difficult to get. Uh, it's also going to be available uh, on whatever you can get Fortnite on. So on your PlayStation, on your PC, your Xbox, your Switch, what have you, you'll be able to play there. Uh, and so that's going to be really important. I think, you know, this is going to be something that would build on the Lego branding for sure uh, mm. when it comes to gaming. They've already done a great job with gaming uh, so far, but this is just going to push it even further with an audience as large as Fortnite's. I mean, it's perfect and nostalgic as well. I hope you get some some Lego goodies in your in your holiday stockings this year. Appreciate you as always, our very own Dan Howley. All right, well, taking a quick look at shares in PayPal sliding this morning as Amazon tells users it will soon stop accepting Venmo for payment. It says this will no longer be an option beginning January 10th, though it will still accept Venmo debit and credit cards. PayPal has owned the popular payment service since 2013. It's now regarded as one of the most popular mobile applications to make in-person payments in the US. Now, the company only announced last October that it would begin accepting Venmo at the checkout. So quite a quick turnaround here. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.